like to ask from you uh, today, if it's possible, to get a list of all the locations that street trees have been list, um, uh, lit, the cost and the locations for the last three years. Because I'd like to be able to share that with my residents who want their pathways lit. I'm sure there are other residents across Brisbane who'd like to know where and how much we're spending on lighting street trees compared to lighting of pathways. Uh, the second point I'd like to talk about is in relation to expenditure by this administration in terms of Maruka Ward. Now, Maruka Ward um, is uh, actually the third largest rated um, uh, ward in the city. So it pays 62, the residents and business out that way pay $62 million in rates a year. And the return that this council delivers for them in terms of capital is is $10.5 million. So there's a big take from Maruka Ward and not a very big delivery. Um, and uh, that is reflected across bushland, it is reflected across infrastructure, and it is reflected across general capital expenditure. Certainly it's reflected also in major infrastructure spend as well. Um, so residents of my ward are a bit upset that so much money, $62 million is taken and so little is spent by this administration. Then again, um, we have a look at, um, at, at what's delivered in the ward, and unfortunately, um, even major infrastructure that would help cut um, delivery times for business in terms of the Coopers Plains Crossing isn't included in that as well. But what I'd like to do is get on to the, uh, what the um, neighbourhood planning um, neighbourhood planning uh, um, project that will be undertaken in Maruka, Salisbury and Nathan and that was announced by Councillor Burke this year. I'm happy to welcome the neighbourhood plan for the area, um, recognise that it will cover Salisbury, Maruka and Nathan. Um, I am concerned about the suburban renewal. Uh, I think we've got scant details on that. And when I look at what the LNP has delivered in terms of suburban renewal, under the Sawley Quinn administration, if you look at an example of, of renewal, inner city renewal, all you'd need to do is look at the suburb of New Farm. And that's a suburb that's been very well um, renewed. Um, it provides a range of housing, provides parks, provides infrastructure. Then you look at the LNP's idea of renewal and you look at Newstead, where the parks are privately owned, where there's no parking, where there's not much heritage um, and where people are pushed and densely pushed into an area. So I think you've got an example of good urban renewal and then bad urban renewal. So my concern is in the past, the LNP have really, urban renewal has been another name for a developer's breakfast. It's been a way to look after developers. And um, I certainly think that I don't want to see that sort of urban renewal happening out in Maruka Way. We don't want this to be a developer's breakfast so that the suburb can be sliced up and diced up so that um, the LNP looks after developers but forgets about the local community. I, um, so I remain um, doubtful about the urban renewal uh, but I welcome the local plan. And um, I would have to say that I have, uh, and I know the community has grave concerns about this administration's delivery of planning at all. Uh, and I know that because I've been involved with many groups in the local area who fought this administration. Okay. So there's Nathan Action Group, there's Clifton Hill Resident Association, Rosebank Square Action Group, Snog, there's the Oxley Durack residents, Archerfield residents when their homes are going to be taken by this administration, and there's the Acacia Ridge Action Group, and not to uh, forget the Tarragindi Action Group. So I've been involved with many action groups and helping them form and helping them present their ideas, and in a lot of instances, helping them have success against this LNP administration. So I have 10 requirements for this, uh, this neighbourhood plan or this uh, planning process that we're going through. 
that I think this administration needs to take into account. And I've um, got those there and I want to put them on the record. The first one is that I believe the planning process needs to be resident driven, not developer driven. Um, and I welcome the state government stopping councillors from taking donations from developers and parties taking donations from developers. But I do note that the Lord Mayor doesn't agree with this and neither does his LNP team. The second thing is we need to build on the strengths of our community. And our community out there is very diverse, it's very multicultural, it's actually a community where people can afford to live, and it's a community where people want balance. So they're not against development, but they expect a balanced approach to development. The third thing is a range of housing. It's something this administration doesn't seem to understand at all. We need to cater for people who are on all different incomes, not just the million dollar set. We actually need to be catering for people who are on low incomes. We need to be looking at social housing. We need to be looking at affordable housing. We need to be looking at a whole range of housing that suits the demographic of the area. And I have to say the area is very close to industry. Uh, it's very close to the city it offer, and it's got a lot of students. So it offers the opportunity for many people who, um, who aren't wealthy to have the advantage of living in Brisbane without having the price tag. Similarly, I think we need community facilities. And the one I'm going to put at the top of the list is a library. Uh, I've been going on about this for a number of years, and um, this, still this administration hasn't delivered one. Still this administration gloats over the fact that there's no library at Acacia Ridge, but when it comes to doing any action, they haven't done anything at all. And in fact, Acacia Ridge has the greatest number of um, people from non-English speaking backgrounds who actually would use a library if we could provide one in that community. Similarly, I believe we need to be providing more sporting, server, uh, more sporting facilities and green space, which gets me onto my next point, more green space. We actually have to have a link between our bushlands and our corridors those corridors being our um, waterway corridors, and we actually need to maintain our waterway corridors. I keep hearing about money for wipeout weeds, but I don't see it being delivered in the waterway corridors that um, go through my area. Um, the next thing is, if we're going to develop in areas where it floods, uh, we need to deal with flooding and we need to deal with waterway renewal. The other thing is, I believe the area is ripe for a precinct for sustainability. And this is a new concept in city planning, but I actually think we need to look at an area that's dedicated to sustainable uh, industry and sustainable development. And I point to Chrome Street um, and uh, to the many businesses that are entering into that area there, many innovative businesses dealing with sustainability in the old war service precinct uh, off Evans Road. Uh, and those businesses are often moving out of the inner city because they can't afford it. Uh, many people who have creative ele elements uh, are moving into those areas because they can't afford the inner city. Uh, and I believe this area for sustainability um, needs to be one that we should foster. The last three points are working with business, and this isn't just big business, it actually, we need to actually work with multicultural business and we need to accept the diversity of business in the area. We need to preserve the history of the area, including our character housing. And the last thing is actually deliver infrastructure and amenity with the plan, not after the plan, as we've seen happening in West End, where the densities come uh, and then we're trying to catch up with, uh, with infrastructure too little and too late. I, um, I believe it'll be an interesting process. I will be there, Councillor Burke, representing residents. Um, needless to say, you'll be out there representing the administration and uh, the, the big interests of the administration. Griffith, your time's expired. Further looks speakers? after. Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rose to speak on program four, Future Brisbane. Mm -hmm which will provide planning and growth management to ensure our city remains prosperous, well-designed, with a distinctive subtropical character. As the father of a three-year-old, I can think of no one better to guide the future of Brisbane than Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. I stand here side by side with the Lord Mayor and the administration to offer a better Brisbane for the future generations. This Lord Mayor 
is a man chair who served eight years as deputy mayor and comes to the role of Lord Mayor full of fresh ideas, motivation and energy. Compare that to the opposition. Pale, mostly male and stale. This is the same Australian Labor Party mentioned in the Australian newspaper today or yesterday. The headline read, worst result in 70 years. 70 years, Chair. Queensland delivered just one Labor senator at the recent Councilor federal I'm election. I to ask you to talk about future Brisbane, if I can. Well, future Brisbane's good. Please. Sure, Chair. I'm just getting to the fact that that's because they have no vision for Queensland and no vision for Brisbane. Queenslanders have seen Labor for what they are, poor economic managers and extreme taxes. Brisbane continues to change and adapt to meet the demands of a modern new world city. As our city grows, this administration remains committed to consulting and working with the community to carefully plan for our future. We will thrive as a friendly and livable place for generations to come. Chair, can you even believe how many lifestyle and leisure options are available to us, to the residents and visitors to this great city? Importantly, we will continue to maintain the character of our suburbs and recognising and protecting those features that are integral to the Brisbane that we love. And Chair, Councillor Shri, as an advocate for better housing, would be thrilled to know this budget has increased funding for the line item for approving quality development better developments for Brisbane. And as a self-declared social activist, I'm sure Councillor Shree will be an ardent, vocal and sustained supporter of the Universal Housing Incentive Scheme. Let me explain a little what it involves. Through independent research and feedback from the development industry, it is clear that there is a need to increase the amount of housing delivered in Brisbane which is designed to cater to the accessibility needs of all residents. We're talking across their lifetime, so that includes the ageing, the disabled and injured residents and families with young children. Of course, responding to the resultant housing stock demands can have significant associated costs. Sometimes these costs can act as a major deterrent for developers who might otherwise be inclined to supply such important housing stocks. Chair, you would be delighted, I'm sure, to know that the Lord Mayor is introducing an incentive for universal housing design. This will assist in the delivery of this robust and adaptable housing type, meaning more people can access appropriately designed housing stock. This groundbreaking initiative will encourage developments of homes and housing that will include design elements, that will meet the Livable Housing Australia's LHA gold performance level. Developments which commence and obtain the LHA gold performance level certification between 1 July 2019 and 30 June 2021 may be eligible for a financial incentive payment. The incentive is equivalent to 33% of infrastructure charges levied for the eligible housing component. Importantly, dual occupancy, rooming accommodation, residential care or multiple dwelling under the Brisbane City Plan 2014 within residential and centre zones will be included. The aim of the incentive is to increase the proportion of housing stock across the city that is suitable for all residents, regardless of their personal needs and circumstance. Accordingly, the incentive will run for two years until the end of the financial year of 2021. Let's talk a little about the features of the housing that's to be built to the LHA gold performance level. Homes will be easier to access and navigate. Housing will be more capable of cost-effective adaptation to accommodate additional needs of residents in the future. And also homes built to the LHA gold performance level supports aging in place. Design elements which contribute to achieving this standard include dwelling access and entries to avoid hazards, doorway, switches and PowerPoint fixtures to be designed for all users. It will also include wider doorways and corridors to allow for ease of movement and internal stairways are to be designed to minimise risk of injury. Finally, varying room designs 
are to maximise safety and movement, including in the bathroom, the kitchen, the laundry and bedrooms. Every councillor in this chamber should be over the moon with the vision this Lord Mayor has for the future of Brisbane. The LNP has consistently delivered for the people of Brisbane. We have responsibly managed the city's budget and we are investing in the future for future generations of Brisbane residents. Like my three-year-old daughter, I commend this program. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Brisbane is renowned for its livability and Team Schrinner, through a suite of programs, is focused on keeping Brisbane that way now and into the future. In planning for our growing city, there is always the challenge of finding a balance between where an increased population will live while maintaining amenity and making Brisbane an even better place. Our city planning is key to that. We need to look after the character of our suburbs and yet also find ways to maintain a vibrant, green and enjoyable lifestyle for our residents. One of those mechanisms is revitalising our suburban village precincts. I'd like to take a little bit of time to speak about the Aspley Village Precinct project because I'm very excited about the revitalisation of this shopping area. The Aspley Shopping Precinct on Gympie Road at Aspley has been a busy community <coughs> hub in the past. It was where the locals popped into the newsagent to buy their newspaper. It's where they picked up their fruit and veg and bought their bread. There was a florist and a lady's boutique. Over time, though, the type of businesses trading in the precinct has changed. Uh, there were many factors, changes in consumer behaviour and, of course, the challenges of competing with larger shopping centres that we have nearby. But what didn't change was the streetscape. This project is part of our administration's commitment to create vibrant suburban centres and create a city of neighbourhoods. And through this program, the rejuvenation of this shopping area will markedly improve the amenity by making it better connected and safer, but also encouraging economic development. Mr Chair, this is a $5.9 million project fully funded by Council. Uh, the project commenced in September last year uh, and the residents were encouraged to get involved in the planning and to provide feedback. And I attended one of the three information sessions that were held uh, in the precinct area with Councillor Cooper and former Councillor Wyndham. And it was terrific that so many people came down to chat to the council officers um, to learn more about what the project meant, uh, but also to provide them with some feedback about how, how they saw the revitalisation pro uh, project um, coming along. So there was a great deal of interest uh, and enthusiasm around uh, the project. It is a shame, though, that uh, had the state government not dragged out the, uh, the uh, approval process, uh, we'd be enjoying the benefits of this revitalisation now. Uh, however, I am still very much looking forward to later on this year when the project comes to its um, conclusion. Uh, but even though uh, residents could come down to the precinct and have a chat to officers face to face, uh, we certainly encourage residents who weren't able to attend to provide some feedback online. Uh, there were over 200 surveys returned, which is fabulous, and this feedback was considered as part of, as part of the final proposal or as it was shaped. Uh, and some of the proposed improvements included upgraded footpaths, street trees for shade, seating, and a particular favourite of mine is a big welcome to Aspley sign. Uh, the public art installations uh, will give it a sense of connection between both sides of Gympie Road because it's, the revitalisation is not just on, on one side of the road um, and, uh, and that should draw those two areas together. Um, it's terrific that uh, part of the installations um, are being designed around historical images that are relevant to, uh, relevant to Aspley. A project that has been completed, though, is the revitalisation of the streetscape of the Ainsdale Street strip of shops in Chermside West. Uh, the funding went towards footpath upgrades, improved safety to an existing pedestrian crossing, uh, some tree and ground cover plantings, along with seating and street furniture. Um, I drove past this precinct about a month ago, uh, and it's looking fantastic. The trees are really well established now. The ground covers are growing very nicely in the new planter boxes. 
Uh, there was a hive of activity um, in the neighbourhood. So I think the investment of 350,000 has definitely achieved its goal and certainly enhanced the character of this lovely pocket of the world. Uh, Mr Chair, residents and industry professionals like to keep track of property development activity across the city. And for these people, Council offers a near real-time service on its website through PD Online. Currently, the system requires people to visit the website each day to conduct their search and to find out whether there have been any new applications or changes to exi existing applications. And this process can be quite time consuming and frustrating. So, to make it easier for customers to keep informed, Council has proposed the adoption of a new alert system, uh, appropriately named the Alert System for Developments. Uh, that means customers can have their search details and be updated automatically when the results of the search change. Um, they'll no longer have to manually search for information, so that's a real step forward. Instead, the search results will be delivered to them by email based on the criteria that they've set in the new system will save customers time and improve their visibility of development activity across the city. Across the, city. Uh, the alert system is yet another example, I think, of how the administration is delivering on what we promised and making things more accessible uh, for residents in Brisbane. Yeah. So along with that enhance enhancement, making development information more readily accessible, uh, we're also improving access to mapping information. An upgrade to the city plan mapping solution will improve accessibility and usability, including facilitating access for users who cannot use a mouse or touch screen and providing a capacity to display the draft changes to the planning scheme for customers to view and make submissions. All in all, we're making our city plan mapping and development systems more genuinely user friendly. Mr Chair, I'd like to commend Councillor Burke on the work that he and his team are doing in this space to make the Brisbane of tomorrow better than the Brisbane of today, and I commend Program 3 to Chamber. Further speakers? Program 3, Program 4. Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and um, I rise to contribute to the debate on Program 4, Future Brisbane, and what an incredible uh, program it is that uh, Councillor Burke uh, gets to lead. I mean, there are other programs in this place that deal with the, the built infrastructure, and we can all, you know, from time to time get a little bit hot under the collar about those things. But the reality is that in Brisbane, the vast majority of investment in infrastructure, in housing, uh, will be from the private sector, not from the government sector. And so here in future Brisbane, that's where we have the opportunity to be able to shape those things through our city plan, through things like Plan Your Brisbane, uh, to City Shape historically, giving this, the citizens of the city of Brisbane the opportunity uh, to have their voices heard through us uh, as a council. Um, there's a lot I want to talk about in this program, but I thought I should start locally um, in uh, the village precincts project section in 4.2.3.1. 4 now, I'm really pleased to see that this year provides uh, an allocation uh, to continue the work on the Kenrose Street uh, village precinct project, which is in my former ward of Doboy, Carina. Um, this is one of those, uh, it, it has historically been a tired little shopping precinct. It had a uh, an Ugg Boots, uh, uh, Ugg Boots factory outlet there for a while and you know, a tired old little bakery on the corner. And, um, but in the last couple of years, it, it, it got a coffee shop and that coffee shop has enlivened all those local businesses. They've all gone and reinvested. Um, and right now there's a real renewal happening there. And when I went through a couple of weeks ago and showed them the plans for the village precinct project, they were just so uh, grateful, so grateful that council had decided, yeah, things are going really well here. We're going to come in and now we're going to retreat the, uh, the the old concrete there, remove the old bins, put in planter boxes, and just rejuvenate the streetscape and support the investment that they've been making in the community. Uh, so I very much look forward to uh, councillor Atwood being able to get out there and tell residents all about the incredible uh, village precinct project that we'll be bringing to Kenrose Street through this budget. And we know that they've been successful, uh, Mr Chair, because elsewhere, um, uh, elsewhere, particularly places like uh, Cannon Hill, where we've done skips previously, Council's investment has been followed by a raft of new businesses. I remember when, uh, you know, when I started in, in 2012, uh, we had nothing but a Victor Moa shop and an old uh, a Chinese uh, takeaway uh, along the main strip of Wynnum Road there at Cannon Hill. And now we have craft beer places, we've got an organic uh, Whole Foods uh, sale, uh, uh, 
an organic whole foods salesperson. We have a, a, what would be an equivalent to an F45 uh, there. It's just absolutely going off. And I look forward to bringing uh, things like the village precinct projects to uh, my new ward of Chandler. So uh, Aminia Street at Mansfield. Uh, I grew up just a couple of uh, streets from there. Uh, that is uh, what I would call a classic village precinct that is uh, looking, starting to look a little bit tired, a little bit underappreciated. So um, you know, we'll be getting out there this year and scoping that out for a village precinct project for sure. Uh, I want to move on to Creative Brisbane in 4.2.3.2. Um, I had the opportunity through uh, my role working as the uh, youth advisor to the Lord Mayor uh, through this term to work with uh, Lincoln Savage and his program. Um, in Creative Brisbane for the uh, Brisbane, uh, uh, all the public artwork that's been installed uh, throughout the city. The last couple of years have seen an explosion of council supported public art, uh, not only uh, in the inner city suburbs, but also out there in the outer suburban areas, out in our wards, uh, tired old bits of concrete and uh, viaducts and pillars and bridges. They've all been painted and beautified. And it gives us a fantastic way to support emerging artists right when they're uh, getting started and they haven't yet made a name for themselves for uh, a client like council to come along and say look we don't just want you to uh, do something that's going to help your portfolio we actually want you to contribute a piece of art that will become a permanent reminder uh, of your walk of your work into the city's uh, streetscape is an amazing thing and an amazing launch platform for uh, emerging artists and uh, he and his team have done a fantastic job in supporting that all throughout Brisbane. Moving on now quickly to 4.3.1.1 uh, alert systems for development um, and this also includes the interactive mapping system in virtual Brisbane. Um, I will say this I, I have long thought in this city uh, we have had a, a development assessment information system which is uh, not industry best practice. Um, this idea that you go on to PD online, you key in a, uh, you know, a, a A00 number and you get a long list of uh, files that you have to download and you know, good luck finding the right file to download if you're not a, an expert in development. Um, that, is, that is not the right way uh, to portray information in the 21st century and it's not the right way to keep uh, residents informed uh, of, of development. But, we are using a system here that we inherited um, from uh, the, the Labor Party back in the early thousands. It's, it's DART, is the underlying system. It, it is uh, antiquated. And we see in this budget, finally, through the very or Orwellianly named Future Development Services Enablement Project, uh, which I'll just call the new DART, uh, we are seeking to replace that system. So there's $1.4 million in this year, uh, rising to 2.7 next year, 7.9 the following year, and then uh, $7.8 million uh, out over the forward estimates. That, uh, that project, like the many uh, large IT projects which this administration has successfully managed over the last few years uh, will enable us to communicate with residents better uh, about development, to communicate with residents in a way that is easy to understand, that is informative and that really explains where uh, the development is at in the process. Um, finally, uh, Mr Chair, I want to talk about the universal housing scheme and I thought, uh, I thought that um, Councillor Mackay did an excellent job in explaining just why this administration is supporting uh, this initiative, this rebate initiative through this budget. Um, there's a couple of fast facts for you, Councillor Mackay, and for the benefit of the Chamber. Um, we have a significant uh, ageing population in this city of baby boomers. About um, uh, one in five Australians currently have a disability of some type, and about 320,000 are children. Now, research indicates that a 60% uh, chance that a house will be occupied by a person with a disability at some point over that, over a person's, uh, over that house's life. And this person is likely to be someone that you know, so a parent, a child, a sibling or a friend. Um, the family home accounts for 62% of all falls and slip-based injuries and costs the Australian population $1.8 billion in public health costs. Um, so there is a, a massive cost to houses that don't suit uh, the needs of universal housing. Um, but this to me was the real kicker, Mr Chairman. Uh, the cost to the homeowner of including key livable housing design features um, 
in this case, the, the silver level, uh, which is the level that we are um, providing the rebate for, uh, is 22 times more efficient uh, to install it when the house is built than to retrofit it when an unplanned need, ar need arises. So, you know, we talk a lot about ageing in place. It's a really, um, you know, hot buzzword for people to say ageing in place. Um, and a lot of people make the mistake of thinking ageing in place and supporting ageing in place is about making sure we can get services like blue care and that into the house. But it's often making sure that the house isn't kicking the person who's trying to age in place out because the house isn't suitable for them to live in. And we all know, because we've all lived this in our life with a uh, an elderly or an infirm relative or friend, um, that houses can kill people uh, if they're not designed right. So I think this is a real sleeper in this budget. Um, this is a real, uh, a real sleeper issue. Uh, I don't think it's getting a lot of attention out there, but what the Lord Mayor has done um, by providing this incentive and with a commitment to make it a minimum a mandatory uh, standard is, is a real game changer for housing in Brisbane. And I think that he should be absolutely applauded uh, for doing that. Lastly, um, just some of the things that um, Councillor Griffiths said, Mr Chairman, and you can't just let them go. He said we had uh, a poor record on urban renewal, that our urban renewal projects had been a failure and Labor's projects had been an absolute success. Well, you know, I just point uh, Councillor Griffiths to the very many EDQ areas in our city, which are an absolute shambles of urban planning. Um, these are the ones we all know about. We've talked about them before. Fitzgibbon, Bowen Hills, Hamilton North Shore, uh, the, the crime-ridden Hurston Quarter. Uh, these are places that have uh, Labor's, uh, Labor's footprints all over them, Labor's fingerprints all over these planning areas, and they have been total unmitigated disasters. And then he comes in here and lectures us on urban renewal failures. I mean, give me an absolute break. And then he had the temerity to come in here and, you know, he went up Mount Stevens and he came down with the, the Ten Commandments of planning as far as Councillor Griffiths is concerned Council on the tablet. Murphy. And Council he said, Murphy, look, we need to support expired. a range of housing in our city. Well, your time, your time has expired. Councillor Murphy, your time has expired. Are there further speakers? Yes. Thank you, Councillor Cumming. Mr Chair, just, just briefly, Mr Chair, uh, one item in this program that annoys me uh, severely is uh, on uh, page 71, the outcome of uh, future Brisbane, one of the outcomes will be achieved by, and I quote, promoting the delivery of a range of housing choices to facilitate affordable housing. Well, that's something that this administration doesn't do at all. They make no attempt to do it. They pay lip service to it. It was paid in, it was mentioned on a re regular basis in the uh, uh, Brisbane's Future B Bluepoint, uh, sorry, uh, re research, uh, Blueprint research. Uh, and yet, uh, what, what, was, what uh, sort of plan did the administration come up to provide that, to deal with that issue? Nothing, nothing. So what I'm saying about this outcome is either uh, be honest and say you're not going to do anything about it and delete it, or else do something about it. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Councillor Burke. Um, thanks very much, uh, Mr Chair. And, uh, at the outset, I just want to thank the council officers uh, for all the work that they've put in to uh, prepare uh, the budget uh, for Program 4, uh, and uh, I look forward to now working with them to deliver uh, the Program 4 budget over the um, coming 12 months. Um, I'm just going to start where we ended there with that sterling contribution from the Leader of the Opposition um, about housing affordability, because, of course, um, in the blueprint, there was an action item to deliver a housing strategy, and the housing strategy was to look at diversity in housing across the city, uh, and the council officers are currently working on the housing strategy, Mr Chairman, and that will be being rolled out uh, later this year for consultation so that we can engage not just with the development industry, but indeed uh, with private sector providers and a range uh, of the, co the community providers as well as residents about how we can look at housing types and housing diversity uh, across the city, Mr Chairman. But, you know, I know one housing affordability pro uh, uh, development in this city that's been underway for a little while now, uh, that would be Hamilton North Shore, which was sold by the then Bly government as affordable housing. Well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know which millionaires they thought they were pitching to when they sold that as affordable housing, but I tell you what, 
tell you what, it's not too cheap to buy in Hamilton North Shore, Mr Chairman, through you to the Leader of the Opposition. So before you come in here and start having cracks about affordable housing, uh, maybe you should have a look in your own backyard and uh, have a look at what policies your own party has in place who are actually destroying affordability of housing in this city, just like your federal leader tried to destroy housing affordability a little bit earlier this year, and that was resoundingly defeated at the federal election. Uh, a lot of stuff to cover in the contributions that were made um, by the uh, by the councillors who spoke, Mr Chairman. Um, I thought it was really interesting yesterday's debate, and the theme in yesterday's debate was that this administration is spending far too much money in the inner suburbs of the city. And of course, uh, we all know that Central Ward and the Gabba Ward are getting the bulk of the increase in density at the moment. Uh, but today's theme is that you're not doing enough infrastructure building, uh, Mr Chairman, through you. So we, hear, we have this, you know, between yesterday and today, Labor Party have changed their messaging again, as they often do in this place. Yesterday, you're spending too much in the city, and then we heard from Councillor Cassidy, oh, there's a, there's a deficit in infrastructure. There's not enough infrastructure being built. Well, we are getting on with the job and delivering the infrastructure that this city needs, whether it's roads, whether it's it's parks and open space, Mr Chairman, whether it is public transport infrastructure. One thing the residents of Brisbane know is that this administration, led by Lord Mayor Adrian Schooner, delivers infrastructure for the residents of Brisbane. It has been our hallmark and our track record to build the roads, to build the buses, to put the ferries on the river, to build the parks of this city for the future generations. The only people in this place who have voted against building parks is the Australian Labor Party who voted against Ken Fletcher Park and who voted against Fruit Park, Mr Chairman. They're the ones who don't want the residents to have nice things. They're the reason we can't have nice things, Mr Chairman, uh, to use that, that saying. Um, so we went from there to there's not enough public art. There's not enough public art in the suburbs, was Councillor Cassidy's next claim. Uh, so I just did a quick flick through my, my budget pack. So in the 18-19 financial year, we did sidewalk art out at Inala. We've done a mural at Jindalee. We're doing a mural on the QR bridge at Gaythorne. We've got public art as part of the Aspley Village Precinct project. We've done a lighting art installation in Moreland's Park at Tawong. We've done a lighting art installation at Bothwell Lane in Mount Cravat. We've done a lighting art installation in Moorvale Lane, Maruka. We've got the Preston Road roundabout lighting um, installation as well. We've got Brisbane Canvas projects at the Brackenridge BMX track, Lutwich Road, Windsor, Mains Road, Sunnybank, Mogul Road, Bell Bowery. Uh, we've got the platform art installation at the Botanic Gardens at Mount Cutha, and we've got the skater out at the Murray Rec Reserve, which is 14 projects in the suburbs. Uh, and when I went through the list, I could only find seven that were in the inner city, what you would probably call the inner city suburbs of the city. So I don't know where Councillor Cassidy is doing his numbers, how he's actually formulating some of these responses. He wasn't at the information session uh, on Friday. Uh, his colleagues did manage to ask me two questions three times each because they either weren't listening or there was no coordination or organisation. Uh, and they were a bit astounded when I said, but I've already answered that. And I still had to give them an answer to the question, even though they already asked two questions three times each. So anyway, we'll, we'll move on, Mr Chairman. Um, we then had this, this claim about the 25-year-old skip at Sherwood, which yesterday was a 20-year-old skip at Sherwood, which actually isn't even a 15-year-old skip or a 10-year-old or a five-year-old skip because I've checked with the officers, council's never actually done a skip in Sherwood. Um, there was... Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, you've already been warned about calling people names. So, Councillor Johnston, I direct you to cease calling people names, um, or you will be formally warned. Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I sincerely apologise for that terrible name in calling Councillor Burke a dill. Councillor Johnston, I have just directed you to stop calling people names. That was a. Uh, Sub to, uh, it was a roundabout way of doing it again, and your warning stands. Councillor Burke, please continue. Thanks very much for your protection, Mr Chairman. So um, you can't redo a skip that was never done in the first place. We have done skips at Corinda, Annerley Junction and Graceful in the Tanson Ward, um, but we haven't done 
uh, one in Sherwood Road at Sherwood, Mr Chair. Uh, then, as um, Councillor Murphy so aptly put it, we had the Ten Commandments, according to Steve, um, Mr Chairman, uh, which uh, came from upon high. And uh, look, I look forward to uh, listening to the concerns of the residents in Maruka and Salisbury uh, and Nathan and uh, you know, taking on board their feedback and the new Labor Party policy of $1 sales for bushland uh, parcels in this city that you know, were so fundamental to uh, the previous administration and to the previous federal government. And I would only hope that in the good Labor vein that this state government is, that they will also offer us a block of land, say, down in Nathan uh, that is koala habitat for $1. But they can go a step further, because here's the challenge. They can waive the stamp duty too, Mr Chairman. How about that? You know, rather than selling it to us for a dollar and then reaping in hundreds of thousands of dollars in stamp duty, how about you channel your efforts, Councillor Griffiths, into getting them to not only sell it to us for a dollar, but waive the stamp duty so that we don't have to pay them $90,000 in stamp duty like we did at Pooh Corner when we bought it off the federal government for one dollar. You know, that's, that, is, that is an absolute wrought if there ever was one, Mr Chairman. Um, Councillor Griffiths rattled off a long list of initiatives and things that he would like to see, uh, those 10 dot points. Um, in particular, I took great note in the new Labor Party policy of delivering the infrastructure and amenity before a neighbourhood plan takes effect. Uh, I hope that that is fully costed going forward for their future budget when they go into the election next year of how they're going to fund to deliver all of the infrastructure that's needed in a community before a neighbourhood plan is done. Either they're not going to be doing any neighbourhood plans. We already know that the Labor Party don't like neighbourhood planning from that own internal email that they sent round, um, Mr Chairman, back when neighbourhood planning start, started, where they identified ways to sabotage the process, to over-create over, over expectations, uh, to work against the process and work against the officers in council, Mr Chairman. That was their own internal memo between themselves. Uh, and so we know that when they talk about neighbourhood planning, it's with one hand tied behind their back because they don't believe in it. They genuinely don't believe in people having their say, Mr Chairman. And we saw that through the Plan Your Brisbane exercise. We saw it as their response to Brisbane's future blueprint. But I think what was most interesting uh, was uh, these two points, one around housing affordability and a range of housing, and another around community facilities, Mr Chairman, because Councillor Griffiths lamented the fact that they need more community facilities uh, down there in the Maruka, Salisbury and Nathan area. And he talked about libraries. And of course, Mr Chairman, the only people in this place who ever closed a library is the Australian Labor Party. And it's at Acacia Ridge in Councillor Griffith's own world, where he's now saying, we need a library. Well, they closed the library. And I'm happy to go down there as part of this neighbourhood planning process and tell the residents that the reason they don't have a library is because the Australian Labor Party closed, closed the library down there, Mr Chairman, through you, because they need to understand the history so that we can help explore the future opportunities in that part of the city, Mr Chairman. Then. Councillor Griffiths talked about the need for social housing and affordable housing uh, as part of this plan as well. And I'm more than happy to um, uh, work with Councillor Griffiths on this. I recently saw a presentation by an organisation called, called Housing All Australians, which is an affordable housing initiative being run out of Adelaide and Victoria, uh, being put forward by the private sector, where they've worked with councils down there to deliver hundreds of affordable housing dwellings on a scheme very similar to an NRAS, where they're actually tied to a long-term uh, rental agreement and protected through a voluntary infrastructure agreement or a voluntary planning agreement is the framework that they use in New South Wales and Victoria uh, and South Australia, Mr Chairman. Uh, and they will see if Councillor Griffiths really wants affordable housing, I'm more than happy to get Housing All Australians up to have a chat to his community about how that model works and how we can see uh, some more diversity in the housing down there in the Maruka area. It is a very well located part of the city. It is close to major transport nodes. It has got large industrial estates, Mr Chairman, uh, and they are key worker parts of the city. And we need to make sure we have a range and a diversity of housing, particularly in that part of the city. And I'm more than happy to work with Councillor Griffiths uh, and Housing All Australians to see what opportunities there might be, uh, Mr Chairman, down there in Maruka. And once again, I thank the council officers for all of their hard work and I commend program four to the chamber.
I'll put the motion for adoption for the future Brisbane program. For all those in favour, say aye. To the contrary, aye. contrary noes. No. Division. 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 Division called by Councillor Burke and Councillor Hammond. Eyes to my right, to nose to my left. Oh, the eyes have it. Alderley, please close the bars. Marks, please read the result. Mr Deputy Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 24 in favour and two against. Please be seated. I now call on Councillor Maddock to present the next program, Lifestyle and Community Services. Councillor Maddock. Mr yes. Chair, I move that for the services of Council, the allocations to the operations and the projects for the years 2019-20, 2020-21, 21-22 2022-23, and the rolling projects for the Lifestyle and Community Services Program as set out on pages 83 to 108 and the indicative schedule on pages 176 to 177, so far as they relate to Program 5, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Maddock and seconded by Councillor Murphy that the services of Council for the allocations for the operations and projects of years 2019 to 20, 2020 to 21, 2021 to 22, and 2022 to 23, and the rolling projects for the Lifestyle and Community Services Program as set out on pages 83 to 108, and the indicative schedules on pages 176 to 177, so far as they relate to Program 5, be adopted. Is there any debate? Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Chair. It's my pleasure to rise as the Chairman of our Lifestyle and Community Services Committee uh, to present Program 5 to the Chamber today as part of the Lord Mayor's Annual Budget 2019-20. It, uh, it never ceases to amaze me the, the depth of the work uh, that is, sits within this division and how far the reach of it is. And I'm always in awe of how much this council delivers and of the officers that deliver this amazing program to the benefit of our whole city. As the Lord Mayor mentioned in his budget speech, this budget is about creating more to see and do to invest and support in Brisbane's thriving arts and cultural experiences. Mr Deputy Chair, Program 5 delivers that with a passion, and it is with that same passion that we bring fresh ideas and fresh energy to deliver this component of the budget for the people of Brisbane. You know, throughout this budget debate to date, we've, what do we see from the opposition? It's all negative. In fact, they can't even manage a single positive comment about our city. All they ever do is criticise. All they ever do is run down our city. Only one side of the chamber has the experience and the vision to keep our city on the right track. Mr Deputy Chair, Program 5 is a program that is committed to making sure Brisbane continues heading in the right direction and delivers on our commitment as an administration to provide lifestyle and leisure opportunities for all residents of Brisbane. Program 5 builds on our continuing cultural investment, Mr Deputy Chair and continues to provide for a high standard of living for all of Brisbane's residents. 
It gives assurances that our residents, to our residents that our continued capital expenditure provides better facilities and better outcomes to them. We continue year on year to invest in our libraries, our pools, our lease sites, sporting fields, and of course, our cemeteries. This program continues to deliver for the residents of Brisbane and provide those wonderful lifestyle and leisure opportunities, whether it is our fantastic festivals, our well-loved libraries, or indeed some of our other sporting facilities. This investment by the Lord Mayor continues to deliver for the people of Brisbane under this budget. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, festivals are delivered right across this city and they provide opportunities for artistic, creative and social benefits for all our residents. And I, they, bring, they bring the community together and build a sense of identity, as well as supporting an inclusive approach to Brisbane's di diverse demographics. Now, once again, Mr Deputy Chair, this administration is proving its commitment to building the cultural life of this city with a continued investment in festivals of over $4 million to a total of 130 festivals, events and creative and cultural organisations. We continue our support for a range of signature festivals, Mr Deputy Chair, with the Brisbane Festival, Queensland Music Festival and Brisbane Writers Festival. These iconic events help to identify Brisbane as a vibrant and creative city. Our signature city festivals find innovative ways to activate public spaces and the city's outstanding cultural facilities, such as the Brisbane Powerhouse. These events bring the best of the world to Brisbane and offer opportunities for a local product to stand tall alongside them. And I note the comments of Councillor Shree earlier within Program 4 about the importance of invest investing in our local creative uh, 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 industry and making sure that we pay all of our performers. And this program continues to do that, engage our creative sector, uh, provide new opportunities for them to build their craft and importantly, pay them for their time and their skill. These iconic events help to identify Brisbane as a vibrant and creative city. It, it, our, our festivals find innovative ways to activate, as I said before, key areas such as the powerhouse and other venues. These events bring the best of the world, and on top of that, we continue our investment in the Brisbane, in the Brisbane Festival with another in initiative outlined in Program 5 as part of this budget for the River of Life. As all councillors would know, um, Brisbane Festival last year, the Maywa exhibition, was an outstanding success. It brought together the importance of our Indigenous culture and educated, informed and entertained all at the same time. And it was of such a success that, again, outside of the existing budget that we're committing to Brisbane Festival is the extra funding for River of, River of Life, an, in an innovative display being delivered as part of that festival, night on night and freely available to everyone. Mr Deputy Chair, events like this is one of the reasons why we continue to see increased tourism and increased attendance in the city uh, and, and, and in the wider spaces as well. By playing our part in investing in these type of events, this council helps support the whole economy here in Brisbane. Mr Deputy Chair, we are investing 797000 which is being invested in 70 suburban festivals right across this city, festivals like the Acacia Ridge Party in the park. Backbone, Barden Community Carols, um, the Nunda Village, uh, End of the Line Festival, Queensland Poetry, Sandgate Blue Water, Wynnum Seafood, the list goes on and on. And importantly, noting the comments of Councillor Griffiths and other Labor councillors about how we focus on the city, this clearly shows that we, do, that we focus across the city. That's why this program continues to engage all sectors of our of our of our suburbs and making sure that we all get that all suburbs get the benefit of this engagement. Multiculturalism is a key part of our deliverable within this program. And I draw the Chamber's attention to the 573,000 which is being invested in 42 multicultural festivals across the city. As a new world city, Brisbane is one of the most multicultural cities in Australia. The latest figures show that one in three of us was born overseas and our multicultural festivals focus on celebrating Brisbane's cultural diversity, contributing to our position as a vibrant, creative, friendly and inclusive city. Through these, our residents can celebrate, respect and welcome diversity and richness and the richness it brings to our culture and lifestyle within Brisbane. 
Examples of this are the All Nations Festival, uh, Fiesta Latina, uh, Moon Festival, Panayiri, Scandinavian Festival, United Nations Day, World Refugee Day. Again, Mr Deputy Chair, the list goes on and on. As part of our engagement within our creative sector, it's importantly also that we continue that strong uh, in, uh, support and partnership with the innovative creative sector. The Cultural Organisations Investment Program achieves this outcome by focusing on supporting organisations that deliver clear artistic, economic and social benefits. In this budget, Council will support 15 organisations for a total of $386,281. This includes Brisbane Estetford from Maruka Award, Matilda Awards from Tennyson Ward, the Brisbane Philharmonic, Opera Queensland, Queensland Symphony Orchestra, Queensland Ballet if from the GAB Award, and Metro Arts from the Central Ward, just as an example of some of these 15 organisations. Mr Chair, on top of our investment into the numerous signature uh, and cultural and suburban festivals, we've also invested in our other cultural pursuits across the city. And that moves me to one of our key areas, which is our Indigenous cultural events. Which service, uh, this service supports Indigenous cultural events including the Gathering Program and Indigenous Art Program. The Gathering Program is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts and cultural program that aims to widen people's knowledge of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture within an urban setting. The Gathering Program is a broad and diverse and free program held weekly on a Wednesday in the Queen Street Mall. It provides a creative platform for experienced and emerging artists. This program is unique and is noted as the only one of its kind featured in the heart of a major capital city across Australia. Within our Indigenous art program is a contemporary art program of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art and culture celebrated through a series of outdoor exhibitions and panel discussions and guided tours. I want to acknowledge the work of Blackbone uh, and the officers in partnership for being able to pre present this tour. I had the great pleasure of being able to go to the opening uh, with Councillor Howard and then the subsequent tour through our uh, alleyways and streets of, of, our, of our city to experience uh, uh, Indigenous culture firsthand and to discuss and participate with some of those creatives. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. On top of that, the, ex the exhibition includes artworks displayed at the Museum of Brisbane and projections on William Jolly Bridge. Our city entertainment program continues to inspire and engage the community by delivering a program of innovative creative events, developing and maintaining creative partnerships and projects, and supporting emerging and established creative workers in their creative productions. And of course, there are so many great programs within this that we've all embraced and the city has. Bands in Parks, Briz Asia Festival, Brisbane Makers Markets, the Lord Mayor City Hall Concerts, the Temporary Art Program, the Cube Effect, the Lord Mayor's Seniors Cabaret, the Lord Mayor's Christmas Carols, the Seniors Week Suburban Concerts and the Lord Mayor's Seniors Christmas Parties, all of them such an important part of the fabric of, of our cultural and, and inclusive community. Council has extended its Sydney Entertainment Program with the addition of a series of events for our young Brisbane residents to participate in. And we will continue that investment within the Lord Mayor's Children's Concert which series, which was run this year and will continue to run in the next financial year. Uh, this event was held during the, the school holidays and the program is designed to engage children aged between five and 12 years of age. <coughs> the program consists of two concerts uh, in January, Easter and the June, July school holiday periods and one concert as part of the Brisbane Festival. We will continue to deliver this free concert series during those holiday periods. Now, Mr Chair, if that's not enough, we then move on to our venues. On top of that, we have within this budget our continued investment in three fine creative institutions, the Museum of Brisbane, the Brisbane Powerhouse and Sunpack. Each of these institutions, Mr Deputy Chair, provide valuable outlets for the creative community here in Brisbane, and we've committed over $10 million to these facilities in this budget. Many councillors would know the value that the, Muse the Museum of Brisbane provides in terms of categorising and detailing the history of the city. And with their most recent show, Brisbane Art Design, or the BAD Festival, which opened recently, um, Mr Deputy Chair, this was an amazing offering across the city, engaging so many different sectors within the creative community. And we had our outstanding attendances at a lot of those events. Really want to acknowledge 
um, the, the entire team and the leadership of the board and CEO Renee Grace for, uh, for their amazing work in making that such a great success. On top of that, the powerhouse continues to provide a place and an outlet for Brisbane's creative industry. In the last 12 months, uh, Mr Deputy Chair, we've collaborated, we've collaborated with the powerhouse to deliver so many great outcomes. And of course, we have the Melt Festival coming up in July and encourage all councillors uh, to have a look at that program and, and go along. But I'm pleased to advise within this budget, I'd like to very much thank the Lord Mayor for the investment of $2.1 million for the improvement works that will be needed at the Bahawa House uh, to provide an even better experience for all of those attending. Mr Deputy Chair, City Hall obviously plays an important part in the city and we continue our investment in making sure that this building is here for a long time going forward. There's over eight million in this year's budget being directly invested into the maintenance and ongoing upgrades. We all know the stories, Mr Deputy Chair, of how, the, uh, how this place was allowed to fall into disrepair over many decades. It was this side of the chamber, the continuation of this administration that made sure that we brought this building back to its glory and continue to make it the people's place. And we'll make sure that we, that the, and with this money there, we continue that strong investment going forwards. Mr Deputy Chair, libraries. We continue also within this budget to invest in our libraries. This side of the chamber has a strong track record when it comes in to investing in libraries, whether it is the construction of new libraries or the upgrade of existing facilities. We don't shy away from the responsibility in delivering world-class facilities for the residents of Brisbane. And we can see that with the six point three million visitations uh, in, in the last financial year across all our libraries. And that's why it's so important that we continue that investment. And we will soon see the end of construction for Brackenridge Library with $3.4 million being allocated to conclude that construction. And of course, the, ex the extension of the operating hours uh, on Saturdays and Sundays in, in, in some of our key locations. We shouldn't forget, of course, and we've mentioned it in this chamber, and Councillor Griffiths has spoken about it in his own acknowledgement that it was his party that closed Acacia Ridge because they allowed it to go into disrepair, because they allowed the numbers to fall away. And ultimately, they made an economic decision to close it down when they should have actually made a decision for the people of Brisbane to invest the money and keep it open, because that is core business, Mr Deputy Chair. That's what we're about. And whether Councillor Cumming was there at the time or not, I'm not sure, but he will know. And he, as part of that ALP, supported that closure, and that's a disgrace. We never want to go down that road, Mr Chair, Mr Deputy Chair, and we want to ensure that this side of the chamber maintains that strong commitment. Of course, of pools and with all of the upgrades that we're currently undertaking, again, another example of core business. Again, those opposite and the closure of Tawong Pool. I still have residents lamenting the fact that the sorely Hinchliffe administration shut down Tawong Pool because, again, they allowed it to fall into disrepair and then they made an economic decision at the time that the maintenance was too great. And because it went into that state, numbers dropped down. But ultimately, if you build it, it will always be supported by the community. And now we've got residents of Tuong looking for opportunities in places that no longer exist because there is no pool. Mr Deputy Chair, this is just a short example of the significant amount of work. There is so much more within this portfolio, but I want to thank the officers for their tremendous work in being able to deliver these outcomes and the Lord Mayor for his strong investment in this program. Councillor Matic, your time has expired. Further debate? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on Program 5, Lifestyle and Community Services. Mr Deputy Chair, I'm very glad we have made it to Lifestyle and Community Services, um, as this program, in my view, is one of the most important programs, and I know Councillor Maddock agrees, as we have heard. This program is all about people. It's about building community, a sense of belonging. It's about our cities, arts and culture, libraries, social inclusion, sport, recreation and cultural facilities, city icons and city venues. This program is the heart and soul of the city. It helps create the social fabric that binds us all together. This is the reason, Mr Deputy Chair, that it makes me so disappointed to see this program has been neglected by this unelected Lord Mayor and by this LNP administration. Once again, Mr Deputy Chair, as in previous years, we do not see any significant increases across the program. 
Last year, we saw city venues as a sole program to see significant increases. It went from 4 million to 33 million. But as we have seen time and time again with this administration, there has been a complete and utter failure to deliver with the actual spend sitting at just over 13 million. That's a $20 million deficit, Mr Deputy Chair, for this out of touch LNP administration who cannot deliver any project on time nor on budget. Expense and revenue in this program remains largely the same across 1819 and 1920. They might shuffle some of the figures around, but it does remain largely unchanged. Like much else in this budget, it demonstrates that the new unelected Lord Mayor is largely out of ideas and out of touch with the needs of the Brisbane community. As was said by the Leader of the Opposition during the budget reply, we have seen no major increase in funding to suburban community festivals, multicultural festivals or to cultural organisations. In fact, our suburban community festivals are decreasing in number this financial year. This last financial year saw 200,000 ripped out of social history in the city compared to what was promised. We see major projects fail to be delivered on time and on budget. Cannon Hill Golf Course, $17 million fail. Carryovers in both Community Facility Improvement Program and Sport Precinct Program, another fail. Sports Field Water Activation carried over yet again, fail. Brackenridge Library Project rolled over with another $3 million allocated this year, whilst other suburban libraries can't provide basic amenities. Fail. Synthetic sports fields carried over and not delivered. Fail. The iconic School of Arts refurbishment rolled over again. Fail. Langlands Pool Upgrade, Musgrave Pool Refurbishment, Balbowrie Pool Refurbishment, Aqua Parks rolled over. Cemetery, cemetery Upgrades rolled over. Fail. Fail, fail, fail. We have seen all but one project in the sport and recreation organisation development category suffer cuts to what was forecast. We all know what the new unelected Lord Mayor thinks of our local clubs. He thinks that anyone who wants to help or save our local clubs is deluded. Deluded, Mr Deputy Chair. He can't fathom what more we could do to help, Mr Deputy Chair. Well, if this unelected Lord Mayor, with all of the resources of the city's council administration at his disposal, can't come up with what more we can do to help our struggling clubs, then Lord help us all. I'm sure Councillor Maddock and perhaps the unelected Lord Mayor as well will jump up and down and probably scream at us on this side of the chamber about what our solutions are. What ideas we have put forward. Mr Deputy Chair, if the Lord Mayor bothered to turn up to even one of the Lifestyle and Community Services meetings, I'm sure he would get plenty of ideas from the detailed discussions we have each and every week, where we run over time because we have so much to say. But in my 18 months in this place, he hasn't once set foot in that meeting room, nor as a councillor or as Lord Mayor. Labor also has a plan, Mr Deputy Chair, and soon enough the people of this city will have a choice about how they want to see the future of the city move forward and what value we place on our community organisations, spaces and facilities. I will give the Lord Mayor one early piece of advice. Don't cut the programs, actually deliver, deliver the projects on time and on budget, cut the funds spent on shameless self-promotion and reinvest those funds in this program. Do more for homelessness. Do more for the youth programs. Do more for our clubs and hardworking volunteers, the arts and our wonderful community facilities. Make them better. Team Harding and a Labor administration will not hang our community clubs and organisations out to dry. We will do better to make sure they feel supported and a valued part of our community. Community clubs are the heart and soul of our suburbs, and Team Harding will make sure they know how much we value them. I want to turn briefly to libraries, Mr Deputy Chair. I want to express my disappointment on the local front for the failure of this LNP Council to deliver when it comes to the Bulimba Library. 
Five years ago, the former councillor for Morningside ran a petition to upgrade the Bulimba Library with over 470 signatures. I ran another petition in this financial year, in March, with almost 180 signatures. There has been almost three months since the submission of that petition, and the silence from this LNP administration has been deafening. This LNP administration can't finish a project on time or on budget, nor can they respond to a petition in a timely fashion. Mr. Chair, Mr. Deputy Chair, that's 650 petitioners in my community who support an upgrade. Yet what do we see from this LNP administration who claim to listen to the people of this city? Well, we know they do, Mr Deputy Chair, but only in the LNP wards. Nothing. No petition response, no funding, nothing. We know that other libraries in the city, like the one in the Gabba, don't even have publicly accessible toilets or disability accessible toilets. It's appalling, Mr Deputy Chair. Happy to take their money in my ward, hike up their rates, but a complete and utter failure to deliver when it comes to this program. Just like we saw with the Corso Village Precinct project in Seven Hills, Mr Deputy Chair, where residents have been waiting 10 years for action, there is no love for the people of my ward, Mr Chair, from this LNP administration. But don't worry, Mr Deputy Chair. The people of Morningside have a long memory when it comes to this LNP administration and to this newly unelected Lord Mayor. They are seeing the failures of the past repeated, and they have the chance to finally have their say on the shuffling of the deck chairs in March next year. And Mr Deputy Chair, it can't come soon enough. For the debate, Councillor Mr. Cunningham. Mr Deputy Chair, I rise to speak on Program 5, Lifestyle and Community Services. This is a budget which is creating more to see and do right across Brisbane and in the Cooper Reward. This budget will see continued investment in our city libraries, whether it be the construction of new libraries or refurbishments. One such renovation that I'm particularly looking forward to is the Stones Corner Library. This library has been delivering services to my community for almost 70 years. Today, the Stones Corner Library is one of Council's smaller facilities at just 248 square metres. However, with a collection size of more than 14,000 items, almost 50,000 visits a year and annual loans of more than 74,000, the library is a valued local service. This financial year, the Stones Corner Library will undergo a facelift, ensuring it remains a vibrant and social place for information, learning, recreation and culture. The scope for the project includes a reconfigured floor plan to maximise public floor space, improved visual connection to the outdoors, there will be an update to the back of house area for improved efficiency, Acoustic treatment to the southeastern walls to reduce the transfer of external noise, a new children's area, which I'm particularly looking forward to, and new carpet and soft furnishings. The Stones Corner Library will also benefit from the installation of new CCTV systems. Deputy Chair, our beautiful subtropical climate means swimming in Brisbane can continue year round especially with heated pools on the two days a year that Brisbane experiences winter. Another local project to get excited about in the Cooper Reward is the much anticipated major redevelopment of the Langlands Park Memorial Pool. The $8 million upgrade is being completed in stages across this financial year and next. Stage one included upgrading the kiosk, amenities block and building a brand new state-of-the-art heated program pool. This pool is home to Storytime Swim Centre, where my son and I have spent many happy hours together. Stage two includes a new 50 metre pool, as well as a 25 metre pool, and a new children's aqua park. The pool is visited by more than 180,000 people each year, and with a lot of young families in the Cooper Reward, this significant investment will be the first upgrade in 60 years. The range of new and upgraded facilities will help make the complex more accessible to people of all ages and abilities, adding to the lifestyle and leisure opportunities on offer to local residents. It will also host thousands of local school children for swimming carnivals, training and competitions. Donning a fluoro vest and a hard hat, it was a delight to get a sneak peek of the construction underway earlier this week. 
When the aquapark and pools are completed in October this year, this site will be the envy of all families on Brisbane's southeast side. Deputy Chair, when it comes to libraries and pools, this LNP administration is investing in these much-loved community facilities enjoyed by families. Compare that to the last time the Labor Party was in administration in City Hall. They closed libraries and pools like the Tawong Pool and the Acacia Ridge Library. In 2019-20, Council will continue to support Brisbane's creative and cultural organisations to drive our creative economy. One in four of my residents in Cooper Reward were born overseas. Under service 5.1.1.1, sorry, 5.1.1.1, Point one, point one. There is more than half a million dollars for multicultural festivals across the city. These festivals help us celebrate our cultural diversity, contributing to a vibrant, creative, friendly and inclusive city. Additionally, there is nearly $800,000 for suburban community festivals. Many of you know that 4MBS is headquartered in the Cooper Reward, and I am pleased that Council will again support their popular Shakespeare Festival. Deputy Chair, another popular local council service for our community that is raised with me regularly by residents is the Council Cabs program. I am pleased to see ongoing support for this transport service, which helps residents aged over 60 and those with a disability. In addition to investment in libraries, cultural events, festivals community and community services, Program 5 also improves access to and increases the supply of local sport and recreation facilities for use by residents. Specifically, the Community Facilities Improvement Program funds a range of improvement projects on Council's leased and licensed community facilities across our city that are often over and above the capacity of the lessee to afford or manage. Whites Hill in my ward is home to the Brisbane Metropolitan Touch Association, a community-based not-for-profit organisation. I am pleased that in 1920, Council will support the design and construct of a new maintenance shed to store equipment needed to maintain fields after the existing structure was deemed no longer appropriate. I thank the Chair and the Lord Mayor for their investment into the club which facilitates touch football games for literally thousands of people right across Brisbane. Still at Whites Hill, and another event which I'm really looking forward to this year is cinema in the suburbs. As part of this new initiative, creating more to see and do, local residents will gather at Whites Hill Recreation Reserve for an event later this year. Finally, I'd like to commend the Lord Mayor and Chair on this program, which delivers for residents of Brisbane by providing wonderful lifestyle and leisure opportunities. There is indeed so much to look forward to in the year ahead. Further debate? Uh, yes, I rise to speak on uh, Program Councillor 5, Johnson. the uh, uh, Lifestyle and Community Services uh, budget in Brisbane City Council. And um, this is one of the uh, uh, components of Council's budget and service delivery that I think most councillors agree on um, provides real and uh, important services to our communities. Uh, that make them livable, fun, um, great places to live. Uh, it's, it's disappointing to hear the amount of rollovers that are happening. I mean, that was just extraordinary. And um, I mean, this, this dates back to Councillor Adams and, you know, perhaps, perhaps it's, well, it wasn't just Councillor Adams, but it's obviously Councillor Burke and now Councillor Maddock. This program consistently does not deliver on what it says it's going to do. Um, and projects are rolled over year after year after year, and I think that is something that needs to be fixed. Um, it's not fair for communities that are waiting when funds are promised in one year, not delivered, then uh, promised the next year and not delivered. That means other important projects waiting have to wait longer. Um, that is a management and a leadership issue um, by this administration, and it clearly needs to be fixed. Uh, look, there's not a lot in this um, uh, budget for Tennyson Ward. Um, the things that are in here are, are fairly standard, would be my observation. Uh, the Sherwood Community Festival funding is a continuing. They haven't actually been offered a new contract. I was at the committee meeting last night and they've been told they have to apply. So they've got to go and fill out a form. They've been running this festival for 25 years, but they've got to fill out a form rather than council offering them 
uh, a contract. I did ask uh, the Lord Mayor for that to be increased from $20,000 to $25,000, but I was told that that's a secret. Um, we can't have that information in the information sessions. Um, their costs continue to increase uh, because, uh, particularly around the traffic and safety issues, it costs more and more to deliver police requirements for the delivery of festivals that happen on the road. And it's the overwhelmingly largest part of um, the Sherwood Community Festival costs. Uh, so it, it needs to increase to keep pace with um, uh, what's happening in the ward. Uh, sorry, uh, generally with security requirements. Um, it is the only, only festival that is funded in my ward. Um, there are dozens and dozens funded around the city, um, and this is the only one that is funded in uh, Tennyson Ward. Uh, I know. I mean, some wards, some wards get quite a lot. Um, other wards, there are other wards probably only get one. Um, but it's not, it's not a fair allocation of um, things around the city. And when there was some opening up of this a few years ago, when Councillor Adams was, was the chairperson, um, I put in submissions for many groups uh, to be added to the list, and that still hasn't happened. And when I met with the Lord Mayor um, a few weeks ago, I also spoke to him about um, adding the Fairfield Community Christmas Carols uh, to the list. It's an event that I've been sponsoring for many years out of uh, the trust funds. Um, sometimes a local real estate agent will contribute funds and it's run by the Fairfield Family Christian Church and they put money into this wonderful outreach into our community. Um, I think, uh, given it's been going for, what, how long have I been the councillor? 11 years? It's probably been going 10 years. It should be part of Brisbane's um, offering in this area. Uh, there is nothing um, down the southern corridor or the eastern corridor of my ward, other than what I contribute um, via the, uh, the local trust funds. Um, the other things that council is doing is fixing broken things. Um, now, yes, tick, you're fixing broken things, that's great. Um, we're replacing the roofs uh, on several sporting clubs um, and we're restumping a community club that's about to fall over. Um, I mean, there's no upgrades. Um, they're not getting anything new. They're not getting new facilities, new improvements. They're getting broken things fixed. That's it. That's it. Um, to me, that's not enough. Um, I am concerned about the allocation of funding within this, um, within this program. And as I have in past years, um, I do not support um, the Cannon Hill Golf Links project. And I'm quite certain every single councillor uh, uh, on the LNP side, and particularly those in the northern suburbs, will now agree that golf courses are terrible things. They're wasteful, terrible things, and uh, council doesn't need to fund them. I mean, they're all so eager to get rid of the Victoria Park golf course, um, uh, but uh, here we are. Council is um, uh, going to spend some 10, uh, 20 million dollars over the next two years allegedly, because it's been rolled over and rolled over so many times, um, to fund uh, a golf course um, at Cannon Hill. I do not support this. Um, those funds can be redirected, I think, to many other projects uh, across the city in my ward and to other wards. Um, and I believe um, there are much more important priorities. Again, when I spoke to the Lord Mayor, um, I asked him to look at um, upgrading uh, the Fairfield Library, opening it for an extra, at least one extra day, that's Monday, or preferably seven days per week. Um, for the past 10 years, I've had the upgrade of Annalee Library uh, on my agenda. I, I'm interested in Councillor Cunningham being the uh, councillor for Stones Corner, but it doesn't seem she's the councillor for Annalee when it comes uh -huh. to that library, um, which is in terrible shape. Um, Robin, um, I think she's acting elsewhere, but Robin is the librarian there. She does an amazing job. She's an extraordinary person who, uh, who participates in community life uh, in my ward, um, as is Fung at Fairfield and Karen at Corinda. They are extraordinary servants of the people of Brisbane and do a great job. Um, that's why I want to see more money going towards our libraries. Um, and uh, obviously the Annerley Library upgrade needs a significant chunk of money, um, and I will continue to lobby for that in the budget. I believe I'm the only councillor that's been lobbying for that in the budget. I don't know that Councillor Mackenzie was ever interested, and it doesn't sound like Councillor Cunningham is either. Um, so I am uh, moving an amendment today uh, to make sure that the uh, library uh, services in Tennyson Ward receive the funding they need to operate. 
Uh, and I move that $100,000 uh, is transferred from service 5.7.1.3 golf courses, Cannon Hill Community Golf Course, to service 5.2.1.1 Lending and Reference Services to open Fairfield Library on Sundays and Mondays. Seconded. We have an amendment moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by uh, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, that $100,000 is transferred from service item 5.7.1.3, Golf Courses Cannon Hill Community Links Golf Course, to service 5.2.1.1, Lending and Reference Services to Open Fairfield Library on Sundays and Mondays. To the amendment. Uh, yes, um, I heard the groans. Um, this is not an issue um, in my area that is, um, should be scoffed at, in my view. Um, and certainly, Councillor Maddock laid down the challenge in his speech that he wants to see ideas coming from us on this side of the chamber. And I presume he's going to be, yes, Councillor Johnston, we're right behind you. Um, he, he stood up in his speech and he criticised he criticised the Labor councillors for having no ideas. No. I one, put one, moment, forward, please, I put one moment, please, Councillor Johnson. One moment, please, Councillor Johnson. Councillors will be heard in silence, please. Councillor Maddock. Councillors will be heard in silence. I've put forward four. Sorry, Councillor yes, Johnson. Right. Please I, continue. I don't mind. Um, I've put forward four um, four constructive. Um, ideas to improve the delivery of services in uh, this city. And this one, um, because we're to this program, I, I rarely get to raise, and to be honest, I was not expecting we'd get here today. Um, but I'm very pleased to put forward this amendment. Um, Fairfield Library is a wonderful community space. It is located next to my office in Fairfield Garden Shopping Centre, which is the largest shopping centre in uh, Tennyson Ward. The shopping centre is open seven days a week. The library is only open five days a week. Where it shows up the most is on Mondays, when the shopping centre is bustling and the library is shut. We have a number of significant practical problems that flow from that decision. Um, the book return bins are full. People drop their books into my office uh, and we hold them until the library is open. Council delivers the books to my ward office on Mondays and then they are transferred over to the library on Tuesdays. Um, so, you know, from my point of view, we can completely improve our council library facilities um, by opening them uh, on Mondays. Uh, our community loves and supports this library. Um, we have petitioned in past years to open it seven days per week. Uh, we have made submissions through the Dutton Park Fairfield neighbourhood planning process uh, to make sure this library service is open seven days a week. I have met with the Lord Mayor a few weeks ago, and this was one of the 20 projects that I put to him, that we need to open at least an extra day on Monday, uh, or preferably seven days. Now, seven days is eminently achievable here um, because of the extraordinary amount of money the LNP want to put into the Cannon Hill Community Golf Links. It's um, 10, nearly $18 million over two years. So there'll still be 17 million and 800 maybe. It's not quite. It's not quite that, but it's it's rounded. I've rounded it up a smidge. Um, but there's still 17 plus million dollars to deliver the Cannon Hill Golf Links. Now, given that this project has rolled over and rolled over and rolled over so many years, I sincerely doubt that it will get delivered this year. But I know from what the Lord Mayor says that he's not in favour of losing green space to build infrastructure like golf courses. So I presume that he'll also be in favour of this amendment um, before us today. Because what it does, um, it still allows the silly golf course to go ahead if that's what people really want, um, but it will provide $100,000 uh, for Fairfield Library to open on uh, Mondays and Sundays. Uh, it would also mean that our library can um, provide additional activities and services to our community. 
Um, Annalee uh, is a part-time library only, and Corinda is a part-time library only. Um, Fairfield should be a full-time library. It is easy for people to access. It has good bus services and rail services. It is completely the spot where council should be investing in an extension of library services. Uh, it is also um, an area uh, where um, we could make inroads to employing more librarians. I think this would be a good outcome for our city. Uh, they are really knowledgeable, welcoming people who provide a great service to the city of Brisbane. And if we're increasing staff numbers, um, taking on some librarian trainees or new librarians would be a very worthwhile um, outcome uh, for council employment opportunities, in my view. Um, I, I just think this is such an important project. Um, I have tried on many, many occasions uh, beforehand, as I said, through the neighbourhood plan and petitions in this place. Uh, I hope that the LNP will uh, support it. Um, it doesn't impact on anybody's uh, the delivery of any project other than a little bit of a cost saving, which is just minuscule in the scheme of things for the Cannon Hill Golf Course. And certainly I know that um, golf courses are not a priority of this administration. Um, presumably libraries are, though, and I look forward to support from Councillor Maddock and particularly Councillor Schrinner, uh, given that he um, recognises that uh, golf courses are not necessarily a priority for this council to deliver. Um, I, I just, um, just want to wrap up by saying that um, I will keep fighting for Annalee and Corinda. Uh, Corinda, we need a, a rear extension, which is um, uh, to expand that to create a room so we can have activities. There is no space for activities over there uh, at all. Um, it, it, when we have Gold Star and those sorts of programs, they've got to move the few little chairs that they have out of the way, and it's a really tiny space. Um, Annalee is the same. It doesn't have a lot of space as well. Annalee needs a major upgrade and there are opportunities there given the space um, around the uh, community hub that we have. Uh, and I just um, ask all councillors to support this motion. Uh, it will uh, certainly allow um, the delivery of an improved service to Fairfield uh, and uh, the golf course, if that's really what the LMP want to do, can still go ahead. Further debate? Councillor Owen. I rise this afternoon to speak in support of Program 5 and. Um, Sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Owen, this is amendment debate yeah. rather than oh, substantive sorry. debate. So is there further contributions regarding the amendment motion in front of us? This is moved by Councillor Johnston. Thank you. There being no further contributions, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Hang on. Point of order. Yeah. There was. Councillor uh, uh, Owen stood up in support. So I would like my right of reply, Mr Speaker. Right, uh, Mr think, Chairman. I think that was made an error, but I will consult with the clerks. Point of order. I'm happy to speak. I think I can. I, I think, <laughs> look, I think in the name of fulsome debate, Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to put on the record um, that despite um, the, the negative and disparaging things that some councillors have said about the Cannon Hill Community Golf Links, Council is very supportive of this project, this, this Labor initiated project. Right. Council is very supportive of it. And it's even more important now that we're repurposing the Victoria Park Golf Course into a big public park. We want to make sure that there's uh, a, a new golf course on the south side uh, to complement the existing golf course over at St Lucia on the north side. That way there's one on both the north side and the south side. Uh, and so when Victoria Park Golf Course does close down, uh, there'll be plenty of options around. Uh, there'll be two public golf courses and then 15, there's 15 other golf courses in the city of Brisbane as well. So I just wanted to place that on the record. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Johnston. And, and I thank the Lord Mayor for contributing uh, to the debate. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, his position is that the golf course at Cannon Hill, um, a private 
uh, venture I think it'll end up being, I don't know if it'll be run by council, uh, is more important, it will be run by council, okay, um, uh, is more important than uh, money going to a community library. Now, to be clear, um, I wasn't proposing all the money go from the Cannon Hill uh, Golf Project. There is some almost $18 million, or it's about 17 point Six, I think, $17.6 million, um, which is proposed to go to the Cannon Hill golf course over two years. I'm proposing that $100,000 goes towards opening the library at Fairfield on Mondays and Sundays. Uh, that would leave $17.5 million to go to the Cannon Hill golf course. So it does, doesn't it? Thank you, Councillor Shrunk. I'll take that interjection. It does seem fair, doesn't it? Um, I note that the Lord Mayor said it's uh, more important that this golf uh, course go ahead, um, and I'm really surprised that that's what he's said, um, because he's made it very clear uh, that uh, golf courses are not important um, uh, at Victoria Park. Uh, and I guess the issue is then he thinks that they are more important than libraries. Um, this would not stop the Cannon Hill uh, golf course going ahead. Um, it would simply mean they had $17.5 million to deliver their golf course rather than $17.6 million to deliver their golf course. Um, but I note that the LNP councillors are not supportive of providing better services to Fairfield Library. Um, this is, I think, the third time that we've tried through the petition, uh, through the um, through the petition, through the uh, neighbourhood plan and now through this amendment in the chamber. And I'm disappointed that it's not supported. I've also um, offered to give up my office uh, and go to an alternate location so the library could physically expand. Um, that was probably six years ago. That was rejected. I think I did that after the 2012 election. Um, to me, Fairfield Library needs to be expanded as well. That would be a good outcome, um, but uh, that was also knocked back. Um, so, you know, I'm really disappointed that the LNP can't see the sense of um, spending $17.5 million on a golf course at Cannon Hill and $100,000 on the Fairfield Library. And I asked them to reconsider. To the amendment, all those in favour of the amendment say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and by Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Clerks, please read, ring the bells. Attendance, please close the bars. Clax, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being two in favour, 19 against and five abstentions. The noes have it. Please return to your seats. Uh, Councillor Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the council now adjourn for afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Sorry, Seconded. Could, could, you, could everyone please stop talking and allow Councillor Richards to move the motion in silence? Please do it again, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr Chair. I will do it again. Mr Chair, 
I move that council now adjourn for a p afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that this council now adjourn for a period of afternoon tea for the purpose of uh, for 15 minutes for the purpose of afternoon tea, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes, aye. the ayes have it. Thank you.
Further speakers? Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I rise to speak on Program 5, Lifestyle and Community Services. Team Schooner administration are committed to ensuring Brisbane continues to grow its vibrant 24-7 New World City with opportunities for all residents, workers, children and visitors to be, feel, explore and indulge in the participation in cultural, recreational and arts activities, which foster inclusion and stronger communities. Program 5, Lifestyle and Community Services, is the pulse of our city. What this council delivers to the community, ensuring that everyone in Brisbane can access relevant community resources, services and facilities. For lifestyle experiences, this program provides opportunities to be active, informed and in the community. As the local councillor for the Pullen Vale Ward, where city living meets country lifestyle, this ward truly organically lends itself to its own lifestyle of urban bushland country lifestyle, yet it's the opportunities provided through libraries via the Kenmore Library and the Mobile Library, active and healthy program, community sport, recreation and cultural facilities that strengthens the quality of life and community spirit. Brisbane is a vibrant, creative city, as is the Pullen Vale Ward, that the festival and event service items supports through delivering artistic, economic and social benefits to our city. I welcome and acknowledge the community festivals that this Schooner administration supports for the Pullen Vale Ward in this 1920 financial year, which are the Brookfield Show, Mount Cuthers Songwriters Festival, Opera in the Gardens, Pullen Vale Folk Festival and the Brookfield, Brookfield Christmas. Thank you, Lord Mayor, for the continued support for a significant ward that contributes so much back to the City of Brisbane. The Cubler Kingfisher Dumbarton Sports Precinct Planning under Service Item 5.5.1.1 will assist the development of the master plan for these three heavily used sporting areas for a growing community that use these facilities and the eight different sporting groups, schools and regional support sporting groups. The past 18 months of community involvement through community feedback, one-on-one -on -one meetings with each of the user groups and neighbouring community groups and residents will now be compiled for issue to the broader community for their feedback on the proposed community use, improved facilities usage, improved asset con consolidation and possible additional opportunities of the use of the precinct. Another exciting addition over the next 12 months will see greater accessibility improvements at the planetarium at Mount Cutha, which is a welcomed addition for all in the community to use and our visitors alike. Over the next four years, the planetarium's digital proje projection system will be upgraded, which offers shows and displays for students, families, residents and visitors. I would like to thank the council officers who deliver under this program. The Community Arts and Lifestyle Chair, Councillor Peter Maddock, uh, for Program 5, and Lord Mayor Adrian Schriner and his Schriner administration that continues to deliver for the Brisbane of tomorrow to be even better than the Brisbane of today. I commend Program 5 to the Chamber. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? <coughs> Excuse me, Councillor Cumming. Yes, Chair. Uh, in relation to uh, Program 5, uh, I think this program involves one of the most annoying abuses of the so-called commercial incompetence by failing to disclose the amounts each of the suburban community festivals are receiving in funding. And uh, this is an allocation of ratepayers' funds to community groups. It's not commercials. There's no justification for uh, concealing the amounts being received. And uh, this is the LNP's secret city at its worst. No wonder the state government is about to change the law and uh, Likewise with the signature city festivals and the multicultural festivals as well as all the suburban festivals. This uh, program also contains the worst examples of the cult of the Lord Mayor by putting the Lord Mayor's name on as many uh, activities as possible as though they were personally funded by him. So we have the Lord Mayor's children's concerts, the Lord Mayor's community fund, the Lord Mayor's senior Christmas party, the Lord Mayor's riders in residence to name but a few. And, uh, I think uh, this is an approach taken by, uh, it tend to be taken by governments in one party states around the world in times past. So, and uh, I'm sure Vladimir Putin does it now, as Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, in relation to uh, a couple of other items, the uh, Cannon Hill Golf Links. Now, I, I know the history of the Cannon Hill Golf Links in that it was uh, originally. Uh, under the Sawley administration looked at the number of public golf courses in Brisbane and we had a lot less golf courses per head of population, public courses, than they did, for example, in Melbourne. So the idea was it would be good to have 
some more public courses in one more public course in Brisbane. But that was a long time ago, and uh, I know uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, the building of the golf course was part of the building of the new estate around the golf course, which has occurred, and I'm sure that uh, it probably adds to the value of people's properties if they have uh, a golf course next door. So I can understand that uh, the, uh, the course will be built. However, uh, I've got some concerns about it. Firstly, I don't think it'll be some sort of trade-off for Victoria Park. I think it's a different catchment. I don't think people who are going to use Victoria Park will necessarily drive you know, halfway across town to, to Cannon Hill. So I don't think that'll necessarily work. But the other thing, call me parochial if you like, but the other thing I'm really concerned about is the effect of the Cannon Hill links will have on the, uh, the Wynnum Golf Club. Now, the Wynnum Golf Club is uh, a, a, a council lease in Wynnum. Uh, the club own their... Uh, uh, the clubhouse and the car park and a couple of, uh, couple of houses next door, but the, uh, the course itself is a council lease. And it's a council lease that the uh, club pays a substantial amount of money for, but uh, they've struggled with uh, membership declining. Uh, they've done uh, all they could to try to overcome the situation. They're working really hard at it, and I hope they do, do overcome the situation. But as it is, uh, they've gone from a situation where they used to have a waiting list for membership, where you, to go on the waiting list you actually had to pay a fee, I think it was something like $500, and then a couple of years later you might get, be lucky enough to get a call up to say, oh, you'll be able to become a member now, and they'd pay whatever it is, it's like $1,000 a year to be a member of the golf club. Unfortunately, these days uh, there's no waiting list and the number of members has declined. And the other thing that is of concern with golf is that the number of young people coming through the ranks is, has uh, declined as well. Uh, uh, Wynnum Club run a very good coaching course for, for, for children and uh, uh, they've got good facilities for kids to play as well and they're doing whatever they can. They've got uh, volunteers instead of uh, paid uh, maintenance workers to do uh, maintenance around the course and around the clubhouse. They actually have volunteers from their, from their membership who do point, that. Point of order, Mr Chair. Um, point of order to you, Councillor Matthew. Most of Councillor Cummings' speech has been a general business about the Wynnum Golf Club and its facilities and what's on offer there. I mean, if we could just draw him back to the substantive debate. Thank you. So my concern <coughs> is... No, hang on, hang on. Hang Sorry. On. Let, let me just address that. Um, this is Program 5, which is about community services, which includes... Uh, Wynnum Golf Club. Um, uh, however, um, the way that you've sort of been, you know, it, you don't get that much time, Councillor Cumming, you have to take a bit yeah, of time on it. So certainly. While there's nothing actually wrong with what you're saying, perhaps there's other things you could talk about as well. Thank you, Chair. No, thank, thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks, uh, and thank you, Councillor Murphy, for drawing me back in the line. I really appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, yes, the problem is that uh, a new public course could uh, kill off the uh, the Wynnum course altogether. So I'm working to try to get that to avoid that happening, and uh, and uh, I've put submissions in on behalf of the club to try to get their lease payments reduced. But uh, it's a, a difficult thing. It's the golf, as unfortunately, as the sport is is declining, uh, less people playing, and uh, people playing alternative sports, and and that's one of the concerns as well that. Uh, the Cannon Hell course, when it starts, may not be particularly viable, and it'll be interesting to see what model is used to see whether it is viable or not. Uh, Pacific course is the other one that's in that uh, part of uh, Brisbane, which has been affected as well, but they're privately owned on privately owned land, and they've come to a deal with a, uh, a uh, aged care developer to put some uh, facilities on their land and get extra sources of revenue through that. So good luck to them, but. Uh, so, but anyhow, that, that's my concerns. Uh, and uh, yeah, the other thing is cinema in the suburbs. I welcome that. But Wynnum's, uh, Manly's got a great cinema in the suburbs put on by the Chamber of Commerce. So we're, uh, we'd hope to see that, that there's no clashes and that uh, they speak to them before they go ahead with the cinemas in the suburbs in, in Wynnum. Thank the uh, administration for that. Libraries is a matter of, I've got some concerns uh, when you talk about increased hours because we've had reports in the past that increased hours for libraries have actually been funded by cutting back the number of staff working in the libraries at other times. And uh, that's a matter of some concern because uh, unfortunately uh, we, we've had some uh, 
problems with uh, people dealing with the public and council. I think as other sections of the of the budget have dealt with that, where uh, unfortunately people are under the influence of alcohol or drugs uh, come onto premises and cause and basically hassle council staff. And there is some safety in numbers. You know, if you've got uh, one or two people working in a library instead of three or four uh, because the, li the hours have been extended, uh, that's a matter of concern as well. So I hope the uh, administration will take that into account uh, and uh, not uh, fund any increase in hours through reductions in staff. Uh, so that's the matters that I think are, are really important uh, in this program. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you. I rise to speak in support of Program 5. And from what we've heard from the other side of the chamber this afternoon, it is very much a case of um, that good old Dickensian line from Oliver Twist. Please, sir, can I have some more? Well, this administration is delivering more, more to see and do across our city of Brisbane. Through this program, we are focused, focused in a big way of delivering on the ground for the people of the suburbs right across our city. Now, it's interesting that we hear from one of the councillors on the other side about, oh, woe is me, we need to upgrade our library over here. I've been asking for it for years. The previous councillor had asked for it five years ago but yet she fails to do her history and her homework. That particular Belimba Library received an upgrade in 2016 when the floor plan was changed and it had new self-service and internet facilities installed with a new service desk and increased seating. So when you actually hear her speech in isolation, it seems like nothing's ever been done. But then again, she only has been here 18 months, as she reminded us, so she hasn't done her homework. And it's very dangerous in this place to come in here and open your mouth and say things when you don't know the facts. And that is what is very important. Now, the fact is that it was the Labor Party who closed the Acacia Ridge Library. It was the Labor Party in administration that closed the Tawong Pool. So when they spruik on the other side of the chamber and start the chest beating exercise to say, look at me, aren't I good? It doesn't wash. It seriously does not wash because the facts speak for themselves. When we're talking about delivery, this administration the Schrinner administration, the Quirk administration and the Newman administration from this side of the chamber has delivered and has delivered in a big way. And I'll just talk about one project that I know I was extensively involved in and so was my colleague Councillor Burke on this side. And our brief for this wonderful people's place was bring it in on time and on budget. And that's what we did. That was a major $215 million project that we brought in on time and on budget. So councillors on the other side need to do their homework and learn the facts, learn the truth, because people on this side of the chamber work extremely hard to make sure we have delivery of projects for the people in our city of Brisbane. Now, it's interesting as well because there is also a comment from the other side about, oh, this program has been neglected. Well, if it has been so badly neglected as those opposite claim, why is it that so many of them on that side of the chamber are receiving funding for program opportunities in their ward, programs that will help their residents? No, they don't want to speak about that. They just want to say, do more, do more. Can I have some more? But this has been the purvey of what we've seen from the other side. We always hear we want more to be done and they want all the money put into their wards. It is not about the politics of envy. It is about delivering 
for the people of Brisbane. And I will take a moment to speak about program 5.7.1.4, the aquatic centres. And I am very proud of how the Parkinson Aquatic Centre has been delivering for the south side of Brisbane. This was a project that this administration ensured was built and has been delivered for the local community. We have seen the swim squad go to over 100 members in a matter of two years. The attendances at that aquatic centre are through the roof and we have never seen such take up before across all of our pools throughout the city. And I know that the residents of my area and the surrounding suburbs are appreciative of that opportunity. It is an excellent facility and it has been built in many a way to service our community going forward and it is promoting social inclusion in so many ways. And it is absolutely wonderful that it has been delivered. Now, the other interesting component of this program is in relation to social inclusion. And I just want to mention, following on from the aquatic centres, um, in the multicultural and refugee initiatives, the Aqua English and Aqua Safe programs. Now, these are extremely important, particularly for communities where they are potentially from refugee situations or they are from a non-English speaking background. Now, for a lot of um, students in particular, but a lot of new residents, they're not necessarily used to being in an environment where there are lots of pools, there are lots of beaches as we have here in Queensland. And so learning aqua safety, learning how to determine what is a safe place to swim is very, very important. And it is very distressing for multicultural communities when they lose one of their own in a rip in the surf, as happened a couple of Christmases ago. And it is extremely devastating when you go and visit the family of that young man and offer your condolences when they live on the other side of the world and they felt extremely hopeless, helpless, when they lost their son because they were so far away. And there are many, many people from multicultural backgrounds who are here living in our city who have no understanding of what our surf is like and what to do in situations where there is water. And I also go back to the circumstance quite a number of years when we lost a couple of people in Forest Lake as well. And that's just an understanding. It's an education program, which is so, so vital. We try to get our young children to learn to swim, but we cannot forget that there are older people, older adults who need to know the implications of water bodies. In respect of social inclusion to a, and a wider scope as well, in our library perspective, I'd like to commend the um, library staff for their a pilot program for the Autism Storytime. I know that there are quite a number of mothers with children with autism in my area, and they sincerely will appreciate the efforts that are being undertaken, particularly in relation to this pilot, but more importantly, for the inclusion aspects of their children. Inclusiveness, and accessibility are very, very important. And when we, when we actually engage with these outreach programs, they can have a significant effect. And as far as community groups are concerned, through program, service 
This administration is dedicated to assisting community groups. If those on the opposite side of the chamber took the time to understand what this service provides, it is about providing advice and support to council lessees, licensees, seasonal license holders, community groups who use council facilities, not-for-profit cultural sport and recreation groups seeking assistance to occupy a facility. There is that support there. There is continued funding for that support in this budget. Councillor Owen, so, your, your again, time is expired. The other side are not saying what is truly there. Thank you. Uh, further contributions? Councillor Strunk. Thank you, Mr Chair. Listen, I rise to speak on Program 5, um, but let me, um, let me first uh, say that um, I don't think I want to be lectured by someone from the other side in regards to this, uh, this program, simply because I wanted to be part of this program in the Lifestyle Committee, but I was kept out for some ridiculous reason, like we were ever going to be able to <laughs> outvote uh, with uh, with our numbers in the uh, in the on the committee, so I, I really um, commend this 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 program, of course, uh, that council has undertaken for many many years, um, because it is a very critical and important uh, one for our communities. And let me also talk about the analogy about oh you closed pools, you closed libraries, well. Quite frankly, I mean, it's a silly analogy because you have closed bowls clubs, you are closing a golf club, yeah, yeah. and who knows in the next 10 or 15 years what the demand is going to be for those two services. Who knows? We could be back here saying exactly what you're saying to us, but in reverse. So, I mean, it's just a stupid analogy, right? Yeah. Now, I'm sure at the time the councils the people, the councillors at the time decided. Claim to be misrepresented, Mr. Chairman. Point of order. No, I did absolutely. Um, of Councillor Owen, I made your misrepresentation. I'll call you at the end of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. The, that the councillors of the day, when they decided on what they were going to do with the library to Cashier Ridge and the Tawang Pool, which I used to use quite regularly when I lived at Turinga, but I saw what was happening with that pool, right? Because I used to drive past it every day. And the numbers were dropping and dropping and dropping, right? But guess what? A new generation comes along, they want to swim. And the parents, and you know, Lori Lawrence, at us all the time about, you know, wanting those kids to learn how to swim. You need pools, right? As Councillor Owen has said, we need to teach our kids how to swim, right? So, you know, honestly, that analogy, and every time you use it in the future, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna come right back at you with these, with these two services, right? Because it's just stupid. Okay. Now, I wanted to, well, I wasn't gonna say anything about that, but you know, just got my blood boiling anyways. So I'll move on to festivals because uh, I think we can all agree that festivals and the festivals that we support uh, right across uh, Brisbane um, are probably some of the best uh, entertainment uh, that our communities can, uh, can find uh, outside of the more formal type of uh, entertainment that we, that we view or, or attend. Now, if we have a look at uh, some of the festivals uh, in my ward, uh, I'm very thankful that they are continuing to be invested in. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, New Year's Festival, of course, and uh, also the uh, Hakka Dragon Boat, uh, Dragon Boat Festival, right, uh, which is still called Parkinson, which is uh, it's historic in name, in nature, I suppose, um, and uh, also the Children's Moon Festival, right? Um, so those are three great festivals that uh, have been going for a number of years, and it's really good to see the councils continuing to invest in those. And I'll also just mention a couple that uh, used to be in the uh, Ward of Richlands, of course, the Carroll Park uh, Harmony Day and the Dara Street Festival, which uh, I'm sure Councillor Brooks supports uh, quite, uh, quite well as well. So. Uh, especially that Dara Street one, there isn't really much happening that does happen over in Dara uh, as far as that, that sort of uh, activity, and it's really good to see that that's going to continue on. Now, those, those activities or those festivals are usually undertaken by community groups, right? Uh, and they spend a lot of time uh, and, uh, and their own capital in putting those festivals on. And I think we should, as I was 
picking up on something what uh, Councillor Cook was saying in regards to supporting those groups in supporting these festivals. And um, so um, it's my understanding that uh, most of these festivals um, are, are supported year in year out. There's very few that drop off, but there's not many that come on board as well because the, if we look at the investment, which is a bit over $4 million, um, there was a slight increase on last year, which was good to see. Um, that uh, we should probably maybe have a look at doing more to help those community groups. Um, I, I just don't know if uh, Council does a review of the festivals, not a review to cut anything, but a review to understand um, how these festivals are operating, especially if they're asking for the same amount of money every year. Because, I mean, prices of rides and all sorts of things go up. And uh, I mean, I, I looked after a spring festival for seven years um, at Forest Lake. And I tell you what, it was a challenging time every year to try to come up with the, with the money that we needed to, uh, to put it on. And so we were always looking at increasing that because the rides kept going up. The uh, stall holders, uh, uh, sometimes you had a lot of stall holders and sometimes you had a, a lot less some years. Uh, and even the food vans and things like that, uh, uh, they wouldn't give you as much uh, much kickback or rebate uh, back on the, on their sales. Um, so it's, it was always a challenge. So I just think that we have to do uh, more with these with these groups um, and maybe undertake a review of uh, of how they're going and what we can do to help. Because I think that's quite. Uh, I think it's it's a very good thing that they uh, all those volunteers undertake. A lot of work. Sometimes it's a six or twelve month program with some, with some of those festivals. Moving on to uh, some of the schedule uh, items at the back of the uh, back of the uh, this particular program, I just wanted to talk about a couple of those. Uh, one is the um, community facilities improvement program area, which uh, again had a bit of an increase this year. Um, but uh, I just wanted to identify one of those facilities that really hasn't had a lot of uh, assistance over the years. Uh, and that is the Anala Art Gallery, the only Brisbane City Council suburban uh, art gallery uh, or art gallery in Brisbane City Council in the Brisbane City Council area. Um, and um, I just want to um, invite uh, Councillor Maddock as the councillor for or the chairman for arts as well out to have a look at this facility because it's uh, something that's been operating now for uh, 10 or sorry, 15, 18 years, something like that. Um, it was established. Um, it used to be owned by the state government. Council bought the uh, bought the uh, bought the building, and uh, it became a, uh, a an art center and multicultural um, uh, uh, center. And uh, so it's been operating for a number of years, but it has had has not had a lot of um, money spent on it. And it probably should be uh, have a look at it because let's say it's the only one in Brisbane. Um, so Councilor Maddock, you can come out and. Uh, and uh, have a look at that for us and see what you, what your, what your take on it now that you're the arts uh, chair. Um, the other item I wanted to talk about, of course, is uh, libraries. Um, and uh, the Anala Library is probably, well, I won't say it's the busiest one in Brisbane because that probably wouldn't be true. But I tell you what, it gets used very heavily. And again, um, the uh, wonderful staff uh, at that library do, do a terrific job in looking after uh, people from, from Anala, Durack, Forest Lake. I mean, the Forest Lake uh, community just comes in droves. They just love that little library. It's little, it probably won't be able to be expanded because it's sort of, I don't know, landlocked or whatever you want to say. But um, it certainly hasn't had much, uh, much uh, up, uh, upgrade, upgrading to it uh, over a number of years. So we probably should have a look at that as well. Um, but I just, uh, and I know Councillor Owens has come out there uh, on a number of occasions for uh, some events. Uh, so she knows how, um, how busy that little library is and they do a terrific job within the community. Um, again, libraries are things that, you know, once these silly things showed up, right? And uh, computers and all the rest of it, we thought the libraries are all gonna close because people won't need to. They'll just stay, you know, just be at home and be able to look up anything they wanna do and read everything online. Well. That isn't the case. Um, people like to uh, do some of that uh, together um, uh, and um, socially, all right? And, uh, and it's just, just a great little space to, uh, to, to occupy and, and have a bit of enjoyment. So um, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I and everyone on this side is in, are in favor of libraries. And, uh, and again, we just didn't think that 
I didn't think personally that they would survive, but it's good that I was wrong because they, uh, obviously people have um, re-engaged, re-engaged them. They didn't move away from them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on this great program, Program 5. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, sorry, I'm Councillor Owen, your uh, misrepresentation. I apologise, please. Thank you. Um, I refer to the claim that I made a stupid analogy, Mr. Chairman. I made a statement of fact. Those on the other side filled in the, the Tawong Pool and demolished the Acacia Ridge Line. Councillor McLaughlin. Please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on Program 5, the Lifestyle and Community Services Program. Um, Mr Chair, if ever there was a program that uh, shows Council's capacity to look beyond roads, rates and rubbish, uh, this is the program. And I think that uh, we've seen uh, support for this program from all sides of the chamber, which is good to see, even with the deft hand of Patrick Condren writing some speech notes for earlier speakers. I, I don't think they could uh, unravel this program. And Patrick, enjoy your mug, mate. I hope you uh, find f fame and fortune elsewhere after your time here with the Labor councillors on this side. Um, but look, um, I wanted to just talk to a, a few Point of the order, issues, Mr. Councillor Chair. Maddock. It's, it's, it's not appropriate for comments to be made about council employees in the chamber. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin, um, please refrain in future from making comments about I, private I, staff. I, refrain, I, I withdraw my comment about uh, Mr Condren and his contribution to the ALP. Uh, obviously, they didn't appreciate what he did for them. Um, I um, want to just uh, commend Councillor Maddock for his excellent chairmanship of uh, this particular program. He did a great roundup earlier of all the things that are contained in the program, but uh, there's so much he wasn't able to get to everything. So just a few things that I wanted to, to comment on, which goes to this theme of the extent of the uh, works that are undertaken in this particular program. And uh, I just was reflecting on um, the service 5.5.1.2, the community lease management, which is a, a core responsibility. But uh, uh, the numbers here are most interesting if people aren't aware of them, listening to this debate, watching this debate or reading the transcript later. Uh, we have, Council has ongoing management of more than 630 leases and licence arrangements with community organisations leasing council-owned community facilities. Uh, that's a staggering number of properties that Council has a responsibility for, and it goes to the issues um, of uh, the responsibilities that we do have to uh, look at the lease renewals, to go through the, the tender processes when buildings become or sites become available, uh, working out who is best to go into those facilities, uh, making sure that they're being properly maintained um, and uh, working with those, those groups that have the community leases, the leases from, of council properties to make sure that those facilities are maintained not just for the near term, but for the long term. It's a, an extraordinarily complex job that the officers undertake, and I commend them for it. Uh, I have some facilities in, in my ward of Hamilton, for example, uh, at, on Kitchener Road, the old fire station that was General MacArthur's headquarters during the Second World War for his intelligence gathering team. Uh, this was a property that was owned by the state government. It was acquired by council when Campbell Newman was the Lord Mayor, so it could be retained in council ownership, because otherwise it was going to be sold to the private sector. Council was able to uh, acquire the site from the state and has maintained it as a, a leasehold opportunity. And uh, community facilities look after that, that property and uh, make it available to community groups. But it's just one example of the numerous buildings, the numerous facilities that Council has available for leasing to community groups. And uh, what a great job that they do. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on briefly was in relation to sports and recreation facilities, uh, and in particular, because I touched on our sports fields earlier in an earlier debate, um, the sport field water activation project. So this is a, a project uh, under 5.5.2.1 sport and recreation facilities. Um, and this has two uh, critical elements to it, the centralised irrigation monitoring and also the stormwater harvesting. So under the centralised irrigation monitoring program, um, which isn't 
uh, it doesn't get a lot of publicity, but um, this point is well worth making, that by the end of the year, Council will have installed the equipment, centralised irrigation monitoring systems, to more than 80 sports clubs across Brisbane. Um, and this uh, helps um, those clubs uh, with the centralised irrigation monitoring to look at their water use, uh, make sure that they're using water wisely and reducing the uh, amount of water that they're, they're utilising to keep their, their fields green. So this is a, an important subset of the work that we do with the uh, clubs, the sports clubs in particular that lease facilities from council. And it's a, a, a dive down into an aspect of how to make sure that they're using resources uh, wisely, in particular in relation to watering. Um, the other element there is stormwater harvesting, which is most interesting, given that we heard a narrative about uh, all projects going towards LNP wards. I was interested to see that in 2019-20, uh, stormwater har harvesting rectif rectification works to improve services to community clubs will be undertaken at these following sites, at the Forest Lake Sports Field at Forest Lake uh, in a Labor ward, um, in the Bill Lamont Park at Loto, the Wynnum Manly, uh, another Labor ward, in uh, Dunlop Park at Corinda, a virtual Labor ward, uh, and Jack Spears Park at Indrapilly, which is an LNP ward. So of the four projects that are being undertaken um, in in this particular project, stormwater harvesting, uh, two are going to labour wards, one to a virtual labour ward. So that uh, that's, uh, puts paid to this uh, narrative that we keep hearing from the other side, that uh, all the project spending, all the, the core spending in the budget is going to LNP wards. I think that uh, uh, I, this is a, a program that um, goes to the, the core elements that Council wants to provide. I think uh, Brisbane City Council is the envy of most small councils in its capacity to undertake these sorts of, um, these sorts of programs, these sorts of projects. Um, and in program five, uh, we constantly see every page from 83 through to uh, page 110 or thereabouts in the budget book, everything that we're able to do to support um, the, the numerous, thing, numerous program outcomes that we want to see in this program. So not just thriving arts and culture, the libraries and informed communities, the active and healthy community, social inclusion, which we haven't talked much about, but uh, very pleased to see that we'll be having a, another exercise at the Doomben racetrack very soon um, for uh, connected communities, uh, the sports, recreation and cultural facilities, looking after our city icons, looking after our city venues. Mr Chair, this is one of the great programs and I'd be very surprised if it doesn't get support from everyone here in this council here today. Thank you, further speakers. Yes. Uh, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to um, speak on Program 5, Lifestyles and Community Service. Uh, I was actually going to say some kind things about Councillor Owen, but I, I won't. Um, I'm going to point out some ironies here, but I'll leave that go in response to Councillor Owen in a little bit of time. A couple other points I want to make. Uh, Fifteen years this administration has been in power. They keep reminding us they have a massive majority and their ideas are all good, but what we keep seeing is no new ideas. And this program is another example of no new ideas. And I know we were challenged on uh, having no new ideas, but let's just remind um, people on that side of the chamber some of the new ideas that they've voted against. I think there was a DV strategy that they opposed at one stage and then they voted for that we put up. There was a smoking ban that we put up that they voted against. Then there was about more active school money that they didn't support. So, can, can and there was... Rivers, I don't mind, like, I've been pretty broad in my interpretation of, of what's relevant, but the smoking ban and active travel probably Yeah, yeah I, I'm pushing it a bit, I agree. No, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought I'd give it a go. <laughs> so I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't have a uh, no, no, I have a question. But I, I just want to say that we have new ideas. In fact, I was out at the Rockley Showgrounds on the weekend with the chairperson of the committee, Councillor Maddock, and we were at the same event together. It was a very good event, and it's an event that council funds, and it had moved to Rockley because they couldn't afford to be, or they'd, they'd outgrown the site they were in. 
And my point to him, and we discussed this, was this is a really good venue that works for a number of community groups who receive funding from council and they do use it. And um, many groups find it easier to use a showgrounds like the Mount Cravat showgrounds or the Rockley showgrounds because they're cheaper, because they're set up for community events. Um, and my suggestion to him was maybe we look at some sort of partnership in the future. So I believe that that sort of thing with uh, showgrounds would make a lot of sense in terms of the city optimising the amount of money we're putting towards festivals, but sort of not repeating the expenditure, if, if that makes sense. So I believe that's an idea that both of us agreed on. And it was a brilliant, um, it was a brilliant event. It was about history alive. And uh, yeah, we do fund it. And uh, they're always looking for more money, like a lot of festivals are. Second point I want to talk about is in relation to libraries. Now, um, uh, there's only, uh, well, there's actually only one ward in the city that doesn't have a library, and that's Callum Vale Ward. Um, so it was pretty painful to listen to Council Owen talk about how ungrateful we are and how we're always calling for new things when she's missing out on the library herself, and she can't say that. But I can say it. I can say there should be a library in Callum Vale Ward. And that would benefit my residents down in Pilara, who there's thousands of them, They're growing, that area is growing so fast. Thousands of them. Uh, but also, I'm aware that her area should have a library. And I don't understand why this administration is not supporting a library down there. I haven't even heard Councillor Owen say she wants a library. Now, I would have expected if you're representing your community, you would get up and say, hey, we need a library down here. Hey, I'm a really active councillor and I want to represent this community. That wasn't happening. It was, you people over there are doing this and this and this. Represent your community. Point of order, Mr Chair. Order to you, Councillor Owen. Will Councillor Griffiths take a question? Councillor Griffiths, will you take no, a question? No, I won't take a question. Not game. No, he, he that Councillor tells Owen. it all. I'm too smart for that. Yeah. Councillor Griffiths, <laughs> 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 please continue. But I will leave it at that. I think I've made my point and I think I, I've tickled some funny bones over there. And I don't think they're very happy. And I think someone is missing out over there, and someone isn't happy, but someone isn't saying it. <laughs> now, I would like to... <laughs> I would like to speak about um, a library for Marika, because we didn't get one in library services. Annerley Library is really... It's a, it's a great space, but it hasn't been looked after, because it's in your area, Councillor Johnson, that just doesn't get funding. Oh, technically Cooperoo. Um, what we have is a, a, an urban village at Maruka. We have a very multicultural population. We have an area that's ripe for a library. So Stones Corner has a library, Tuong has a library, Ur Nanda has a library. Urban villages that we do have libraries. And Maruka is an urban village and it should have a library as well. It's about thinking about the future, thinking ahead, um, and being a bit proactive. And I've certainly been proactive on this point. I did write to the former Lord Mayor at the beginning of this year when a building, the old netball building, came up. It's a perfectly, uh, perfectly set up space for a library already. It's the right size, two-storey, disability access, all the car, car parking done, everything available. He wrote back to me and said, I appreciate your idea, but no, I'm not going to do it. It sold for $2 million. So we had the potential to get a building there for $2 million. Um, that would have been a perfect setup for a library. It is now up for lease. And it would be a perfect place to have a library and a perfect place to relocate a ward office so that you could save that, I don't know, eighty dollars or $100,000 a year that's spent on rent for that. You're supposedly the economic managers of the city. This is an idea that works. And it's an idea that benefits uh, residents and benefits some of the most disadvantaged in our community. So yes, I will keep saying I need a library. Hopefully, Councillor Owen will join me on that quest. Uh, the next thing I just want to say in terms of hoarding and squalor, 
Uh, I'm pleased to see this initiative grow. This initiative rose out of the issues surrounding a resident I had at Tarragindi. And at that time, uh, we were going to throw her out of her house because she hadn't paid her rates. She was actually going to become homeless. And it was actually Campbell Newman, wouldn't take my calls, I was trying to ring him to explain the situation. This administration voted um, for that to happen, and then they backed down on it. But that was Campbell Newman, and that was this administration. But at least one, and eventually the administration backed down. We were able to get support services in for this woman and find a way, because you shouldn't be thrown out of your home because you have, and it's not necessarily a classified mental health issue, but it is certainly a condition uh, that she, she had to have medical treatment for. So I'm pleased that at least this is one of the positive things that have come out of that. And we are leading the world with this one. We're actually leading the world in terms of hoarding and squalor at a local government level. We should all give ourselves a pat on the back with that. Uh, the next one um, I would just like to say, and one I'm really concerned about is, and I believe this is rorting, is the outdoor cinema in the suburbs. Here we're spending $221,000 to do 10 uh, set places where there's outdoor cinemas four times a year, I believe. Eight of those places are in LMP wards. Eight. Eight of the 10. Now, I haven't seen the distribution of where they are in the city. I would have thought they'd be on ward boundaries so that multiple wards, if this is the real intention of them, could share them. I don't know that. And unfortunately, I believe this is not right because we are funded through our ward trust fund to fund movies. This is just extra icing on the cake, predominantly for LNP members going to an election year to use this funding. And that concerns me greatly. The final thing I just wanted to mention was about Mount Cravat Cemetery. I can't see that there's more maintenance there. I can see that we're going to be clearing more land. I just want to give a heads up that I don't support clearing of any bushland on Mount Cravat Cemetery without us doing an, uh, a wildlife survey and look at the, um, the, the, the koalas and the, the wildlife that's in, that, in our particular reserve there that adjoins Griffith Uni and Tui Forest. We should not be destroying any more koala habitat in this city. We should be looking for alternatives to that. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, and I apologise to councillors for whose, um, whose debate I missed. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of enthusiastic discussion. I'll catch up on the transcript later. Um, just on this program, I want to um, thank and congratulate the officers who work so hard to deliver these important services for our city. There's a, really, there's a lot of good stuff in this program. Um, I might start with the uh, movies in the suburbs. Um, service because personally I don't think that's actually a, a bad thing and um, I guess yeah, I mean even if you do the maths on it roughly eight out of ten councillors in this place are LNP so statistically you might expect that from time to time that's going to happen um, but I think my, my biggest concern was just around value for money and how many actual movies we're getting for that amount so four, four a year so that's fifty thousand dollars each okay um, is that, yeah, no. that's, I guess, surprising to me because... No, that's... Um, if someone wants to take, uh, clarify that later, I'd just be interested in clarifying that figure. Um, we do movies in, in my award from time to time. My office ha has bought a large projector. We've bought a large outdoor screen. 14. 14, okay. Right. That's, I mean, I think, I think it's worth just in, inquiring around value for money around this stuff. I'm, I, it's a small amount of money in the grand scheme of the budget, so I won't quibble over it, but... I do note that sometimes it's cheaper for um, council to deliver this stuff in-house or indeed for ward officers to, to deliver this stuff with council support rather than outsourcing to private contractors. And so I'm sure there'll be conversations about the best way to deliver that, but I would cautious again, caution against giving that contract to a single private contractor. Um, there are probably more efficient ways to deliver it. To um, so the rest of the, the program though, um, I want to again acknowledge that there's a lot of funding for local suburban festivals and multicultural festivals but 
I remain concerned that we're underinvesting in these programs. Um, as other councillors have noted, there's, this is really worthwhile stuff to be investing funding in. And in general, it's, it's a shame that it's such a small proportion of the council budget. Um, I do remain concerned as well around the, the, the branding of some of these events, but I, I'm, I'm sure that point's been raised about the fact that everything's called the Lord Mayor's this and the Lord Mayor's that. Um, the Creative Hub is getting funded again, and I'm really grateful to Councillor Matic for the renewed funding for that. I reiterate my previous comments that it would make more sense financially for Council to just buy a site to use as a community facility. For those councillors who haven't been following this project closely, um, the West End Creative Hub was announced uh, a couple of years ago, and each year the council spends about $100,000 a year um, renting a private property that's essentially being used as a community arts hub. And it, there's so much great stuff happening in there. It's a really excellent project. It's been activated really well. Lots of different community groups are using it. Um, unfortunately, the rent keeps going up. I think it's now going up to $180,000 a year. So by the end of the first five years of this project, we'll have spent close to a million dollars um, on that facility, and it does make me wonder if we would have been better off just buying a site, um, particularly because the current owner is apparently resistant to supporting live music at, at the location. So I'll, I'll work constructively with council officers and with council Matic to see if we can find uh, a constructive way forward. But I, I hope the administration doesn't take my concerns as um, indicating that I'm not supportive of the project. I'm very, very supportive, and I think it's really great but again, when, when there's so little funding for the arts in general, I'm always conscious about making the best use of money and, and wondering whether it, just giving that money to a landlord as rent is the best possible use of arts funding. Um, I reiterate my previous concerns about the um, inadequate and reduced opening hours of the West End Library. This is a consistent concern for residents in my electorate. I know some people will say, oh, but they're only a few kilometres from the CBD. Why can't they go to the State Library? Why can't they go to the Brisbane Square Library? But these, these small suburban libraries tend to service those residents who aren't as mobile. And there are plenty of people who live within close walking distance of the West End Library who don't have the ability to travel into the city or don't have the ability to travel further afield to access other library services. So when this library is closed, they just don't have access to one. Um, and when I think about what sorts of things council can and should be spending more money on, extending library hours is a really obvious one to me. I understand we're trialling extended op op library operating hours in the CBD, which is really, really cool, and I welcome and support that. I think that's an excellent initiative, but I don't see why we can't take a similar approach to some of these suburban libraries. Certainly the feedback from a lot of people in West End is that after dark, there's plenty of restaurants to go to, there's plenty of bars, and there's, there's live music options, but um, everything costs money. There are very few free nighttime activities these days in the inner city. And so making, these, making some of our public libraries open later in the evening would provide people with an alternative recreation option as well. And I think that's something to be considered more deeply. Um, I'm also just conscious about the way we, um, we plan some of our sport and rec uh, facility management stuff. I've had conversations with council officers around this as well, but um, in general, I feel that the con there aren't enough ongoing detailed conversations with councillors and the community facilities planning team around what their thinking is and what our thinking is as a local councillor. And there have been a couple of times where I've had really great meetings with those council officers. Um, and both parties have learned a lot and it's felt really constructive. But they're obviously really time poor and stretched. And it, it occurs to me that if, if we had enough staff allocated to that program, there'd be more regular communication between the councillor and the officers. So I often find myself sending emails or making calls and sometimes they don't get returned or it takes quite a few days or a couple of weeks to get them returned. And that's always a sign to me that staff are overworked. And so it, given that there are so many community facilities now that need intensive management, that there are so many growing challenges with those older facilities, it might be time to just look close, closely at the staffing allocations under that program because I, I do think opportunities are being overlooked. Um, the same goes for the Indigenous Aspirations Strategy. And I, again, I think that's an area where we could be investing a lot more, ditto multicultural communities. Um, in, in general, this, this whole program item is characterised by the fact that council is just not allocating enough money to Program 5 in general. And so everything is underfunded, everything is short-staffed. 
and, and I think when I compare how much money we put into paying transport engineers and how much money we put into so many other parts of the budget, it's, it's a shame that we put so little into the um, lifestyle and community services areas that, that council does so well. Um, I, I won't um, harp on too, too long, but just finally reiterate that the West End Public Library still needs a toilet. It's a really simple thing. Libraries should have toilets. I know it's an old building. I know it's challenging, but as a matter of common sense, a public library really ought to have a toilet that's available to the public. Um, and there's an extra council building next door. There's, yeah, there's one tiny little one upstairs, Council Marks, that's not ordinarily available to the public and it's not wheelchair accessible. Um, and the staff only allow people to use it on special occasions, I understand, such as when there are events in the tower. So generally speaking, there's no, no toilet there at all. Um, and it's one of those, I've, I've had this conversation with Councillor Burke and with council officers before, it's a difficult building to retrofit, but there's space behind the building. There's another council owned facility next door. There's money identified in the LGIP to redevelop those two sites together to deliver a larger library and community centre complex. And rather than me standing up here every year and saying, why doesn't a library have a toilet? Maybe it's time we go, proceed with that project that's identified in the LGIP and was supposed to be delivered quite a few years ago. Um, the, it's the Kurilpa Hall. I'm, I'm sure Councillor Shrin is aware of this by now. I've, I've been raising it for long enough, but the Kurilpa Hall's next door. The, we've got the West End Library. We've got space in the car park. Let's redevelop that facility as a single larger library and community centre. We can keep the heritage building out the front. It would be a great thing for that growing suburb where we've had thousands and thousands of residents move in and no additional community facilities or improvements to community facilities. So please give our library a toilet block or just a toilet, one cubicle. That's all. It can be unisex. I don't care. I just want my residents to be able to ha use the toilet when they're at the library. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on uh, this uh, program, uh, Lifestyle and Community Services. And I want to just start by um, saying thank you and paying tribute to um, all the fantastic staff that work uh, in this area of council. It's uh, an area where um, they have a great deal of interaction uh, with uh, the public, whether that be through community leasing, through our community um, uh, centres and community groups or sporting organisations or through libraries um, where you know, they see a broad range of the community and um, uh, deal with a broad range of issues from time to time. Uh, so it, it's certainly um, a fantastic, um, uh, this program is a fantastic um, cross-section of that kind of community work that those thousands of uh, a council staff do on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, I do think um, sometimes uh, those staff are put under um, pressure when it comes to the kind of work that they're trying to deliver and the kind of resources that they are uh, given to work within. And yes, there's not an um, unlimited pool of funds available, um, uh, but when it comes to things like appropriate staffing for our libraries and having appropriate um, levels of um, support in our homelessness area, uh, or particularly in our um, sporting club area, uh, it's important to uh, recognise that these are the front line uh, workers within the council that interact directly uh, mostly with, um, with uh, members of the public. And that is quite often the only experience that some members of the public will have with council as an organisation. Uh, so I want to make sure that you know, people out there, the, the public, have a good interaction when they come into places like libraries and they're well supported when they use those facilities and the staff that are working in them are well supported as well. And knowing that when the announcement uh, came a few years ago of extended library hours, uh, that um, it was very difficult for library services to get the additional resources that were required to staff them uh, appropriately right throughout the year. So we had instances early on where um, some of those libraries were left with um, for might only been an hour or two at a time through the week on different shifts. Um, just one, one only staff at those times. So if that staff needed to go to the toilet or, or take care of something um, quite quickly, that, that library was left um, 
unstaffed in some places and understaffed, which is not a great work environment. So providing uh, the kind of resources um, to particularly our libraries uh, is very, very important. And also our sport and rec officers uh, that are out there uh, dealing with um, sporting clubs, whether they be bowls clubs who um, are in desperate need of uh, finding new ways of remaining uh, viable um, or um, other sporting clubs. And I have one in my ward at the moment that is going through um, quite a difficult process of uh, looking at um, um, going into voluntary administration as a club uh, and the kind of support that they are getting from council, and this is no reflection on the council officers because they are doing what they can within the resources that they have, um, if there were more resources available uh, I think there would be a better outcome coming down the line for that club. Uh, they've been advised, the club's been advised they'll have to go and come up with a solution themselves, maybe talk to another club and get them, get them to underwrite their problems and then come to council with a solution rather than council being able to proactively work with them to ensure that one of the most historic um, sports clubs uh, on the north side of Brisbane can remain uh, viable going forward. So they do great work, uh, but they could do so much more great work, Mr Chair, uh, out in the community. Uh, when it comes to festival funding, uh, I am pleased that um, the existing festivals, um, both um, uh, the um, suburban community festivals and the multicultural festivals that received funding in previous years, uh, will continue. Christmas in Sandgate, which is uh, hosted by the Sandgate and Districts uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Iron Bumpin Festival, which is coming up on the last Sunday in July, uh, which is uh, largely run out of my office uh, by my staff and a great group of volunteers and auspiced uh, by Sandbag, the Sandgate and Breckenridge Action Group. Uh, music by the Sea Festival, <clears throat> which happens uh, every year in January. Uh, Sand Cliff Riders Festival. Um, we had uh, Nick Earls. Nick Earls to that. Uh, Councillor Johnson, you're a fan, I know, last year. Uh, Sandgate uh, Blue Water Festival, the Blue Water Festival, which uh, the Lord Mayor announced, sort of announced, almost got to announce at the Blue Water Festival that that funding would be increased, uh, but we got rained out this year, which is uh, quite rare actually that that happens at that festival. Still a great day though, at, uh, on Good Friday this year. Uh, and this, and the, the two multicultural festivals, South Pacific Island, are Christmas celebrations, which I all support through uh, uh, LMCIF funding, and the Zulmia, uh, it used to be called the Zulmia Multicultural Festival, that's what it's called here, it's now called the Zulmia Festival. Uh, so we probably need to reflect that in the budget going forward. Um, it is a great celebration, uh, which I know Councillor Cooper supports through her LMCF, and so do I, in addition to this funding as well. And it is uh, a fantastic uh, festival on the north side um, of Brisbane. Um, I was hoping that we would see, after a number of years uh, of the um, uh, Visaki Festival that is uh, hosted by, this year, the Punjabi Cultural Association, and in previous years, Singh Saba. Um, Gudwara um, at Tagum, and they partner with the Sangate Hawks Football Club and host a, a fantastic um, a Sikh celebration that is open to the entire community. Uh, it is growing each year. Uh, costs are rising each year. Um, you know, we do what we can through uh, LM SIF. It's always at the back end of the financial year, so it's always difficult um, uh, to um, bring together as much money as we can uh, for that. And I know there are a number of councillors, including Councillor. Owen and Councillor Cooper and Councillor Wyndham that came, and I know uh, the organisers certainly uh, have raised with me and raised directly with those councillors about um, getting some funding, any funding um, centrally from council to support that ongoing work because they uh, won't be able to continue to meet those costs going forward um, as a pretty fledgling um, sort of festival, but a very important one given that from the 2006 census, uh, people of a Sikh faith uh, did not register uh, any numbers in, in the community. Uh, sorry, in the 20, uh, that was a 2011 census. Uh, fast forward to the 2016 census, uh, they've grown to 2.7% uh, uh, on the north side of Brisbane. So there's rapid growth uh, in people uh, uh, from that part of the world now um, calling Australia home. We host a um, citizenship ceremony as part of that uh, festival uh, each year. Uh, and people um, think it is a very special way to become uh, an Australian in such a fantastically multicultural uh, event. So I just um, want to uh, reiterate that um, events, we need to see growth uh, in the funding for multicultural events, and that's just one of the very important ones that could do uh, with a whole lot of uh, uh, more support um, from council going forward. 
And just finally, um, I know Councillor Griffiths mentioned the Mount Gravatt Cemetery, and I, I just want to make mention of the Pinaru Lawn Cemetery. I know there has been upgrades there um, over the last few years to some of the uh, facilities that are in there, uh, but the uh, lawn area and the lawn graves area are in desperate need of more maintenance. So I have uh, residents who have, and I, I do as well, have grandparents that are in the ground there and go there from time to time. And I have residents that go there quite regularly. Uh, there is the war grave section there as well. And, and I'm getting an increasing number of people coming to me and saying uh, that um, uh, that place needs a lot more maintenance. There is a lot of um, uh, sunken, um, they're not headstones, but they're, they're brass plaques on, on um, uh, concrete pads. That, uh, sinking into the ground. There's a lot of subsidence happening. Uh, there's a lot of overgrown sections. Um, the, the sort of experience when people are going there, it's obviously can be very emotional for people to go there. Um, I just think we can do so much better and um, would certainly advocate uh, for more funding to go um, towards that. And, and I will continue to raise this on behalf of residents uh, going forward. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Maddock. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair, uh, and I'd like to thank all councillors um, for their uh, comments and their participation in the debate in this program area. Um, I think it's something that we all agree on that uh, Program 5 is, is uh, something that we uh, all agree that the, uh, that the work there is important and that the contribution uh, by council to the community is absolutely fundamental and, and the work done by officers to deliver those outcomes is outstanding and we all acknowledge and thank them for their work. I guess even in that spirit of inclusiveness within this program area, even the comments by councillors uh, opposite in regards to some of the criticisms weren't actually that sharp or attack. I appreciate that as well. And, um, and, and in that spirit of inclusiveness, I, I shall respond accordingly. Um, can I start firstly um, in regards to funding and uh, uh, we could all always seek more funding for festivals and events uh, across the city. I mean, all of us clearly see on a regular basis uh, more and more members of our community passionately committed uh, to an event or a cause uh, that would love to run a festival and we all want to support them. And, um, and as Councillor Johnston said, uh, in regards to funding for more uh, festivals and the need for extra funding because of increasing costs, um, all of us have uh, events in our wards that we, we fund almost wholly from our Lord Mayor Suburban Initiative Fund, uh, and, and that's what it's there for. Um, and for all of us, we would all like to have even more festivals and events on, on that list, and we continually look for those opportunities. But in the absence of that, um, we're all in the same boat in regards to that. Um, and that funding continues through, that, uh, through the SIF to be an important part of that. Um, I noticed the question uh, Councillor Johnson raised around the streamlining of processes around uh, approvals and so forth, and that's something that we're certainly already working on in how we can make it easier uh, for our community organisations uh, to run their events uh, and try and reduce the amount of red tape that they have to go through, because they are obviously volunteering their time uh, to run these festivals and events. And so it, uh, we have a role to play uh, and do uh, through Philo. Uh, but I think there's more in that process that we are currently looking at. Uh, in regards to the points uh, that Councillor Strunk made uh, around uh, Inala and the gallery, um, more than happy to come out and have a look, Councillor Strunk. Uh, that gallery has been there for a number of years uh, and has, uh, its focus has been around diversity uh, and I know in previous years around Indigenous art but also a reflection of the very multicultural community uh, within your ward. Um, and by all means, happy to come out and have a look at that. Um, in regards to um, some of the comments around libraries, um, at, and Councillor, uh, Councillor Cook, certainly I could understand, uh, wanting to see more improvements around Bulimba Library. We all want to see more uh, within our own libraries. I'm, I can say that um, the most recent improvements uh, within her library were in 2016, uh, when the floor plan was changed to accommodate new self-service internet facilities, uh, a compact ser service desk and increased seating. So we're constantly working on our libraries, renovating, changing, tweaking, improving on the floor, uh, the footprint of what is always there uh, and where the opportunities arise, as we've seen, um, where the, uh, like as Brackenridge, for example, where we look at brand new libraries, but 
I know within uh, my time within this portfolio over the last year, um, the improvements that we've seen at New Farm Park Library, which is the existing footprint, uh, but an enhancement of that and, a, and a, an outdoor area, which made an enormous improvement. Uh, and also um, the opportunity at Garden City uh, with Council Huang uh, with, the, with, the, with the landlord uh, to look at how we could expand that facility. So it's not something that we choose not to do. It's obviously something that we will continue always to look at and how we can better improve that. Um, within Fairfield Library, uh, the amendment uh, that Councillor Johnston made um, for $100,000 for Saturday and Sunday, just as an example, uh, there would have to actually be a significantly more contributed to that just for that library alone to open seven days. And so uh, we always work towards maximising what's there. And uh, you know, even in this budget is reflective of that, that since February 2017, all libraries, including Fairfield, uh, have been open every Saturday from 9am to 4pm at a cost of $848,000, uh, which I say I said is, is in this budget. Um, in regards to the comments that Councillor Griffiths made, uh, and we did, uh, he and I went to the Rockley Showgrounds together um, and saw History Alive um, and certainly took his comments on board around Rockley Showgrounds, have started a conversation with officers around that relationship with that. And I know that History Alive uh, is, is funded by Council. Um, they've been around for 20 years uh, and they, uh, I think they were down at Lytton originally and this was their first year at Rockley. Um, interestingly, uh, the feedback from the convener was that uh, the event is quite significant in cost because it's a two-day event. Um, and they used to get funding from the state government, uh, but the advice from one of the state members there at the time at, at the event was that that funding was cut um, and they lost all of it. Reason being that the state's priorities were around other areas and the member did mention um, dealing with uh, natural disasters, uh, but it seemed uh, disappointing that when the allocation of funding across the state, that an event is significant in this over two days where it used to get, I don't know how much from the state, but it used to get a, ma a fair amount, uh, is now zero. But council will, has and continues to support this event because one of the key parts of this portfolio too is the importance of supporting our historical organisations and societies. A uh, significant amount of work is done uh, in this portfolio around protecting our heritage um, through our heritage branch uh, and being not only about uh, obtaining um, artefacts of historical value to our city, uh, but also um, um, digitising information so it's widely available for our history groups, uh, but importantly also the substantial amount of money that we put uh, around not only uh, uh, annual events, such as Open Doors, um, but also supporting peak body groups, um, uh, representative of all the different history, uh, history groups across the city. Um, and um, I note uh, Councillor Griffith's comments also uh, around the issue of homelessness and uh, remind all councillors that 27th of June uh, is again Homeless Connect, so if you are available, please uh, come down and participate in that. Um, and you mentioned the issues of around hoarding and squalor, and it is a very challenging area uh, for people affected by this, not only directly, but also by their families and their neighbours. And so uh, the work done by the officers in that space is challenging, but um, they're highly skilled in being able to address those issues and work with those poor people who are emotionally affected to the extent that they are around uh, needing to be in that space. Um, there was the comment made around movies in the suburbs. I thank Councillor Shree for his comment around how we've spread it across the city and what we're attempting to do through this is uh, by placing it on the boundaries of adjoining wards so that all councillors get the benefit of it. And uh, as all councillors know, uh, we all run movies in the park. They are not a cheap process. We would always like to run more. Um, but of course, there are all the licensing issues uh, that are absolutely key uh, in that and we're not in the opportunity to simply put up a screen and put a DVD on. There are copyright and royalty issues. We all talk about um, producers' rights and being able to ensure that uh, the creatives that produce that work are paid. And so the royalties uh, that are associated with the presentation of those movies is absolutely fundamental and non-negotiable. 
uh, but that comes at a substantial cost. Um, this Lord Mayor's program is a great one for all of us. We all know how much our communities love our movies in the park. This adds another $200,000 uh, to that uh, uh, program uh, so that there is even more uh, movies in the park uh, across wards. And as I said, we're uh, spreading it out across the city on adjoining wards so that all councillors can get the benefit of it, irrespective of which side of the chamber they're on. Um, and I, I note uh, Councillor Sharif's comments in regards to the Creative Hub uh, at West End. Uh, it is, uh, I've had the good fortune of being down there before and uh, meeting with the lessees, uh, very passionate young people involved uh, specifically in the area of modern art. Um, and uh, the works that they exhibit are outstanding and it's great that they are supporting local talent. They also provide a, a mentoring program uh, on the second story of the building, uh, which goes a long way towards providing a space for creatives to, uh, to communicate with each other because it's a shared space and to learn from each other, but also the opportunities to grow and nurture their skills to, to they get to a point of uh, where they're able to support themselves either in their own space or a different gallery. Um, I acknowledge uh, the comments of Cass Councillor Cassidy uh, around the different festivals uh, that are within his ward. I uh, also note the challenges of uh, some of our sporting clubs out there. Um, Councillor Maddock, your time has expired. Oh. I'll, now put, um, I'll now put the item. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division, Mr Chair. Division called by Councillor Burke and Councillor no. Maddock. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Clerks, please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Um, councillors, could you just, um, just allow the clerks to um, read the result, please? Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 25 in favour and one against. Thank you. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Councillors, I draw the attention of the room. Program six, customer services. I now invite Councillor Maddock to present that, but I remind him that debate will conclude at five o'clock. Councillor Maddock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that for the services of Council, the allocations for the operations and the projects for the years 2019, 2020, 2020, 21, 21, 22, and, 20, and 2022, 23, and the rolling projects for the customer service program as set out in pages 109 to 119, so far as they relate to program six be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Maddox, seconded by Councillor Cunningham, that the services of the council, the allocations for the operations of projects for the years 2019, 20, 2020, 21, 2021, 22, and 2022, 23, and the rolling projects for the customer service program as set out on pages 109 to 119, so far as they relate to, to program six be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, it is my pleasure to rise as the chairman for the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee to present program six. The chamber today is part of the Lord Mayor's annual budget 2019, 2020. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a program area that uh, we all passionately support because this is a program uh, that, has, that is so grassroots in regards to the council's ability to interact with ratepayers of Brisbane throughout this program. It is refreshing to see that both the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor uh, have both 
uh, endorsed and favoured this program as much as I have myself. And we can see an increase in funding across each of the component parts of customer service. That being managing animals, community health, public safety, community engagement, customer service delivery and customer experience. Mr Chair, animals are an important part uh, of, of, of people's lives within our community. And we see this with over 100,000 dogs being registered in Brisbane. This is an enormous figure. But, uh, and as part of that, we want to be able to achieve great outcomes for residents uh, when, in managing their animals. We actively encourage responsible pet ownership with events and information to assist our residents in support of their passion for their pets. As part of our responsibilities under the animal management, we offer extensive rehoming facilities to the residents of Brisbane. Councillors, I know it's late and we've been here a long time, but can I just ask, just for these last 10 minutes, just for, for us to, be, to allow the speaker to be heard in silence, please. Councillor Maddox. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. That the Lord Mayor has again endorsed with increased funding to support our animal management responsibilities, such as issuing animal permits, impounding animals found in public places, responding to complaints about animals uh, in Brisbane that are not being controlled while in public places, investigating dog attacks, providing valuable rehoming services, as well as supporting responsible pet ownership. As part of the Lord Mayor's 2019-2020 budget, we're continuing with our animal registration enforcement campaign with nearly a quarter of a million dollars allocated to engage with pet owners and investigate dog complaints and follow up investigations into unregistered dogs. We're also funding pet fairs and school, and school pets and people events across the city with additional funds allocated to the FIDO program, which is a Find Irresponsible Dog Owners campaign. So as part of that program within those areas, we are seeing improvements to our two existing facilities at Willowong and at Brackenridge and making sure that the enhancements we're making to those two facilities continue that close association those facilities have with uh, potential pet uh, owners, but also people who are collecting their animals, so that it, it ultimately becomes an important part of that customer service experience. Mr Chair, we will see as part of that animal management, um, uh, part of what we're doing importantly also is around the area of animal, uh, com uh, around complaints. And I know within the information sessions, there was a number of questions around that issue and looking at how we deal with the issue of compliance. Now, of course, education is absolutely fundamental to this. And that's why the um, programs that we run are, are really focused on the issues of ensuring that your uh, dogs are registered and then uh, responsible pet ownership and then making sure that we offer services and facilities that are associated with pet ownership for people's information. Now, Council has implemented a number of approaches um, in being able to uh, manage these things. And so um, we run different programs, not only for um, uh, adults, but also for school children, uh, so that everyone has a role to play around uh, animal management. And the education program, for example, that we run through schools includes promoting appropriate behavior towards animals, the importance of microchipping, registration and desexing, reducing the number of animal attacks, improving animal welfare, helping to decrease the number of wandering pets that have an adverse effect on native wildlife, and better management of household pets to reduce the number of animal-related complaints, including walking your dog on a lead, picking up dog droppings, and understanding and managing animal noise. Council officers have also conducted site inspections uh, for wandering animals, and as the program that we have where we directly uh, go into hotspot areas, um, has, that has proven to be very effective in regards to raising awareness of pet ownership in certain areas, uh, but also the issue of registration uh, within those areas, which is always key. So um, we, of course, have a very strong relationship with, uh, in our, with other sponsored organisations uh, as peak bodies in regards to animal management. And, uh, council, and t uh, the council will continue to, to sponsor the RSPCA and the Animal Welfare League of Queensland to subsidise the sexing of cats and dogs in Brisbane. Desexing domestic animals is a key initiative that Council continues to support through its partners that share the same responsible pet ownership messaging. It is anticipated that Council will continue to provide sponsorship 
uh, for Operation Wanted with the RSPCA. Um, and Operation Wanted is an initiative to increase the number of animals being desexed to reduce the number of animals producing unwanted pups and kittens. It is anticipated there will be a flow-on effect of reducing admissions of unwanted uh, pets to councils' rehoming centres. In addition to supporting to the support provided to the RSPCA, Council will evaluate um, our Getting to Zero program that, that we work with the Animal Welfare League on and continue to explore further opportunities to work with them in this financial year. This uh, Getting to Zero program is a cooperative desexing program that has been designed to enable ongoing low-cost desexing of cats by offering pet owners um, ex experiencing hardship a subsidy on the veterinary costs associated with desexing. Uh, we've also, um, in, Council has also proposed to incentivise registration by offering new discounted dog registration fees, including new fees for first-year dog registration, representing a 25% discount off the previous annual fee for both desexed and non-desexed dogs, and new fees for dogs adopted from select pet shops, um, the RSPCA and Animal, the Council's animal rehoming centres with a 50% fee reduction from the previous annual fee for the life of the dog. This initiative is, uh, will have a positive impact on adoption rates at our rehoming centres and other adoption centres. Um, and these incentive programs are a great way to promote responsible pet ownership and encourage voluntary compliance with dog registration requirements. Now, um, moving on to community health, Mr Chair. This administration continues to protect the health of Brisbane residents with increased funding for Service 6.2 Community Health year on year. We take a serious view of reducing public health risks and maintain health conditions in our city as can be seen in our Brisbane Vision 2031. We see increased allocations year on year for this administration to continue to assist industry to achieve safe standards for the food and health businesses in line with legislation. And our Eat Safe program is uh, a leading uh, assessment and uh, coordinated program of managing uh, food safety uh, uh, across all of our uh, businesses, uh, food businesses within the city. Uh, Eat, Safe, Eat Safe is certainly one of the leading programs across the nation uh, and is a, a tribute um, to officers and this program that we see uh, so many food businesses with a, a, a star rating of three uh, to five. Um, we, of course, um, within this program are focusing on the importance of pool safety. Our city is a river city and our residents continue their love affair with water, uh, with properties all over Brisbane having swimming pools. We are improving water safety in our city by ensuring that these pools are safe and compliant. The service uh, was endorsed last year with over 90% of pools inspected being free of major non-compliance within the Queensland Building Act. Now, um, within the area of uh, immunisation, we are continuing to reduce our residents' exposure to vaccine preventable diseases by continuing to provide free immunisation for infants, children, parents of newborns and seniors of preventable diseases that are defined by the National Health and Medical Research Council. Um, we work very closely uh, with Queensland Health in regards to this and are guided by them as to their priorities for each year. Um, and our record of immunisation stands up for itself with over 7,000 immunisations performed for mothers, infants and carers in over 500 clinics at 14 locations across the city. Our residents enjoy the no appointment necessary and low cost immunisation service, which is reflected by these numbers. Um, when we look at um, our different programs within this area, the budget for mosquito management sits within this program, although it is delivered by Councillor Howard uh, within our asset services team. But last year, we treated over 71,000 hectares of targeted wetland uh, with our ground-based crews. We also recorded 110,000 visits to recognise mosquito hotspots with treatments and inspections by council staff. And this was accompanied by um, our aerial control program that treated over 18,000 hectares by helicopter. Um, this program, this council, uh, is the only one of its kind in Australia with uh, medical entomologists uh, on staff. Our medical entomologists work very closely uh, with different levels of government uh, and associated academic bodies uh, in regards to the management of mosquito-borne disease. Uh, uh, and uh, they also oversee the program 
uh, the sample testing within areas and make sure that we stay on the front foot uh, in regards to this issue uh, and the risks of airborne disease through mosquitoes. Uh, we are also uh, the only uh, South East Queensland Council to offer a rodent detection service to our residents historically. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, before we get to that, can I just thank the officers very much for their work within this program area. Uh, they do an outstanding job uh, and they are delivering a great service. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Manick. Councillors, it has reached five o'clock and therefore the budget debate has concluded. Uh, as a result, I will now put the remaining um, the remaining programs um, in order. I now put the motion for the adoption of the program number six, the customer service program. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division called by Councillor Maddock and Councillor Burke. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Um, attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 25 in favour and one against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. I will now put the motion for the adoption of the program number seven, the Economic Development Program. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division called by Councillor Owen and Councillor Burke. Um, ayes to my right, noes to my left. Thank you. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour, one against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. I will now put the motion for the adoption of the program number eight, the City Governance Program. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Called by Councillor Owen and Councillor Burke. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour, one against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs.
I'll now put the motion for the adoption of the businesses and council providers. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Called by Councillor Adams and Councillor Owen. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendance, please close. Councillors, councillors, can I just have a bit of silence? Councillors, everybody, we're just going to allow the clerks so that they can hear the you can hear the result. Uh, please turn off the bells, clerks. Please read the result. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 25 in favour and one against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. I'll now move to the uh, adoption of the resolution of rates and charges, the annual plan and budget. Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor, um, the adoption of the annual plan and budget, please. Now, Mr. Chair, I move that Council resolve to adopt all recommendations in the resolution of rates and charges 2019 to 2020, including all provisions and appendices as set out on pages 215 to 310 of the annual plan and budget document as tabled, uh, and also to adopt the annual plan and budget contained in the 2019-20 annual plan and budget document comprising of A, the budget of financial statements, including the budgeted summary of recommendations and the budget statement of income and expenditure, the budgeted statement of income and expenditure businesses and council providers, the budgeted statement of financial position, the budgeted statement of cash flows, the budgeted statement of changes in equity, the budgeted summary of recommendations, long-term financial forecast, and the budgeted statement of financial ratios as set out on pages 7 to 15, and the revenue policy and revenue statement as set out on pages 202 to 214 of the annual plan and budget document, and B, the adopted budget programs for programs 1 to 8, and the businesses and council providers. C, the rates and charges as set out in the resolution of rates and charges, including all provisions and appendices, as set out on pages 215 to 310 of the annual plan and budget document. And D, the fees and charges as specified in the document entitled Scheduled of, Schedule of Fees and Charges, including all provisions, appendices as tabled. And finally, delegate the Chief Executive Officer uh, of all of its powers under section 11 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010 to waive, refund, discount or remit fees and charges as set out in the schedule of fees and charges on the conditions set out in the general conditions of delegation tabled and otherwise in accordance with the notes contained within the schedule of fees and charges as tabled. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the Council resolve to one, adopt all recommendations in the resolution of rates and charges 2019-20, including all provisions and appendices as set out on pages 215 to 310 of the annual budget and annual plan and budget document as tabled. Adopt the annual plan and budget contained in the 2019-20 annual plan and budget document comprising A, the budgeted financial statements including the budgeted summary of recommendations and the budgeted statement of income and expenditure, the, budget, the budgeted statement of income and expenditure businesses and council providers, the budgeted statement and financial position, the budgeted statement of cash flows, the budget, budgeted statement of changes in equity, the budgeted statement in summary of recommendations, long-term financial forecast, and the budgeted statement of financial ratios as set out on pages 7 to 15, and the revenue policy and revenue statement as set out on pages 202 to 214 of the annual plan and budget document. B, the adopted budget programs for programs 1 to 8 and the businesses and council providers. C, the rates and charges as set out in the resolution of rates and charges, including all provisions and appendices as set out on pages 215 to 310 of the annual plan and budget document. And D, the fees and charges as specified in the document entitled Schedule of Fees and Charges as tabled. And three, delegate to the Chief Executive Officer all of its powers under section 11 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010 to waive, refund, discount or remit fees and charges as set out in the Schedule of Fees and Charges 
on the conditions set out in the general conditions of delegation tabled and otherwise in accordance with the notes contained within the schedule, schedule of fees and charges as tabled. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? Yes. Point, point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm getting this um, something wrong here, um, but just with respect to three, the delegation uh, for the chief executive officer, isn't that part of the special meeting that we're being asked to approve? Like, I'm just a little bit confused. Um, that seemed to be the special report that we were about the delegation. Is that is it different? I'm sorry, I just need to clarify. There's quite a few different items. I think, yeah, Lord Mayor, if you could, as part of your uh, presentation, please. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, please provide notes on that, Lord okay. Mayor. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so just to clarify that point. Um, the, uh, it's normal to delegate uh, certain things to the CEO in, as part of this process, including where we want to make changes to fees and charges. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the special meeting relates to um, a certain specific set of fees and charges, um, and that's the economic development ones relating to the malls. So uh, that's in addition to the ones that we're approving through this particular resolution now. Just moving on generally, I want to start with some thank yous. Um, first of all, thank you to the CEO and the budget team and all of the council officers that have been involved uh, in making this budget happen, putting it together over a period of many long months um, in the preparation of this budget. Uh, in fact, dating back to well before um, I was standing in this position. And so I want to thank them for their long hours of work and dedication uh, to the City of Brisbane and to making this budget come together. I want to thank uh, the Finance Chair, Councillor Allen, and I also want to thank the Deputy Mayor, Krista Adams, who was the Finance Chair uh, and started this process. Uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, Councillor uh, Allen and Councillor Adams' staff members as well, who really uh, helped put this together. I want to thank uh, yourself, Mr Chair, and also the Deputy Chair uh, for uh, two days of long debate particularly the clerks as well. Thank you. Um, uh, as I've said before previously, you managed to keep a straight face during all of that, which is far more than we could achieve. Um, so well done and thank you for your patience um, and, and dedication to the city. Uh, there are so many people that work together to make this happen and I'm very grateful for that effort. This budget uh, will help us achieve the main aims of this administration. And those, those aims, are threefold. Uh, building the infrastructure our city needs as it grows, uh, whether that infrastructure is transport infrastructure, active transport infrastructure, uh, road upgrades, community facilities, all the range of infrastructure that our city delivers, this budget funds it. $932 million in capital works included in this budget. So almost a billion dollars uh, out of a $3 billion budget. If you look at the equivalent uh, at the state government level, I understand, um, so ours is you know, around 29% of our budget um, goes into capital works. At the state level, I think it's about 21% of their budget goes into capital works. Uh, so our budget is very much geared towards building things. And despite the fact that we employ a lot of people, uh, there is still an incredible amount of uh, effort and expense and focus on building infrastructure for the city as we grow, as we go into the future. And that is absolutely critical for a growing city like Brisbane. But the second part and second focus of the budget is protecting and growing our incredible lifestyle. And that covers a whole wide range of things across many different programs. And in fact, every program in this budget has uh, programs and initiatives that support the growth of our lifestyle opportunities that support the protection of our incredible lifestyle and our incredible natural environment. Uh, and that is absolutely critical across all programs. And finally, the third focus is that this budget helps us move towards our aim of being Australia's most small business friendly city uh, with a raft of new initiatives to help and support small businesses right across the city. And those targeted initiatives will, uh, will go a long way but we will continue down that path to make sure that uh, Brisbane is open for business and particularly supportive of small business because this is where the big job generators are out in our community, out in the suburbs, creating jobs for Brisbane people, creating economic prosperity and wealth 
for our city, creating the jobs for our children and our grandchildren going forward. And so it's a budget that's focused on the long term of the city, the long term future, and that future is a bright future. We are incredibly optimistic about the future. I can't say the same thing for those opposite. Uh, they, uh, their approach has been really disappointing. It's a very negative approach. And uh, while Councillor Cumming said no one likes a whinger, uh, they spent the entire two days whinging. Um, and so it's just, it's fascinating. But look, in the end, we will remain positive because our focus is on that long-term, exciting and positive future for our city. And this budget helps to deliver on that long-term future and the long-term aspirations that we've had. There's been a lot of debate about a range of different projects and initiatives and programs, so I'm not going to cover um, areas that have already been touched on. But I want to go up to the helicopter level, the big picture, uh, and particularly focus on uh, the interesting response that Labor had to this budget. Because you can tell a lot by what the opposition focuses on. Uh, obviously, uh, we are positive about this budget. Obviously, we're excited about this budget. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, what is it that uh, Labor has said? Now, their response has been genuinely mind boggling because here you have a Labor opposition uh, that wants people to believe that they don't like taxes and they don't like debt. That's effectively what they started off saying when this budget first came out. Rates are too high, debt is too high. That was their, that was their main attack. But interestingly, um, those same people have just been active in supporting a federal election where Labor went into the election with a high taxing, high spending agenda. An agenda that was all about introducing new taxes, targeting retirees, targeting business uh, and creating a class warfare situation. Now that agenda was resoundingly rejected by Queensland residents and Brisbane residents, thank goodness. Uh, but this is what is in Labor's DNA, high taxing, high spending, high debt. And if you need any more evidence, you have to look at the state budget that was brought down just the day before ours. It is the uh, budget which has delivered the highest level of debt that Queensland has ever seen in its hist history. New taxes, higher taxes, more taxes. Yet Labor councillors come in here with a straight face and want us to believe that they don't believe in debt or taxes and that under them, somehow it would be different. Well, it would be different. There'd be more. There'd be more taxes, there'd be higher rates and there'd be more debt. Uh, and they're, cla they're claiming now that it would be lower. Uh, the, only way, the only way it would be lower is if Labor started slashing and burning. If Labor cut programs and projects, if Labor cut staff, cuts and chaos is the only way that Labor would have lower rates or lower debt. But interestingly enough, their position was so different to their actual party position that Labor Party headquarters made a bit of a boo-boo. Um, and repudiated uh, the Labor councillor's position. Because the councillors here want to believe that uh, they've turned away from their old ways of high taxes, high rates and debt. Um, yet, up the road, Labor headquarters uh, tweeted on our budget day uh, about how debt was actually good. Debt was actually good. And so the Queensland Labor Twitter account tweeted their support of our budget strategy of responsible borrowing to build infrastructure. And I'll quote their tweet. It said, Adrian Schrinner said, you can't build a city without building infrastructure. We agree. That's Queensland Labor agreeing. That's their quote. They support our approach. So they were quite happy to throw their Labor councillors under a bus in order to support their state government Labor colleagues. Now, now, let's have a look at the facts here. Let's talk about debt. The debt at the state level, from what I can gather, is about $15,000 per person, and that will continue to rise. Here, if you look at the budget in the front there, it will be $2,100 per person at the council level. So when you, when you start, and yes, and, and it will rise, 
but it still won't rise beyond $3,000 per capita. And so at the, at the moment, it's $15,000 per capita at the state level and rising. And according to Premier Jackie Trad, that level of debt is manageable. So who do you believe? Do you believe Jackie or do you believe Peter? Do you believe Jackie or do you believe Jared? Who do you believe? I don't believe any of them. The reality is that this is a responsible budget with a responsible level of borrowing that funds infrastructure for the bright future of our city. Uh, and so we will continue to uh, practice responsible financial management uh, and uh, that will help stand our city, our city in good stead going forward uh, as we have done. We have always consistently ran uh, run bad budget, uh, budgets in Lord balance. Your time's expired. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, three days. Three days. That is all the time it took to punch a million dollar hole in this unelected Lord Mayor's budget. Tinkerbell Shrinners pledged to provide free travel for pensioners unravelled spectacularly. Point of order. Pro proving yet again. Point of order. Um, Councillor Owen. Uh, Mr Chairman, in accordance with the meeting's local law, councillors in this place are to be referred to as councillors, not Tinkerbell. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Everybody, everyone, um, I will take this opportunity to remind all councillors that when referring to each other, please use the appropriate titles. Point of order, Mr Chair. I'm happy to be known as the Green Fairy. <laughs> Councillor Cumming. Councillor Srinner's pledge to provide free travel for pensioners unravelled spectacularly, proving yet again that he really does think there are fairies living at the bottom of the mayor's garden. <laughs> Rather than throwing off the shadow of his mentor Graham Quirk, it cements him as an incompetent economic manager. All it would have done, taken is a call to TransLink to find out the real cost of his unfair fair promise, but he couldn't even manage that. Instead of the $3.1 million that has been allocated, the program will actually cost more than $4.5 million. We don't get much in the way of the Minister of Support on this side of the chamber, but I do have a calculator that I'm happy to lend you if you need one, Lord Mayor. <laughs> You're a nice little unit. Um, <laughs> it begs a question, what else has this incompetent, unelected Lord Mayor got wrong in his first bumbling budget? Councillor Schrinner claims he's burdening Brisbane ratepayers with good debt. Good for who? This billion dollar debt splurge weighs ratepayers with a whopping $2,101 per capita, climbing to almost $2,500 per capita in five years' time. That's up 25%. And that's in spite of a rapidly increasing population. Brisbane ratepayers cannot afford this out of touch, drunk on debt administration. Total council liabilities are set to rocket up from $2.5 billion to more than $3 billion next financial year an increase of 32 per cent. But the tale of financial woe does not end there. In two years' time, those liabilities are cranked up to over $6.5 billion, another 100 per cent increase. This is an administration that is blind drunk on debt. Team Harding will not abdicate its financial responsibilities the way this out-of-touch administration has. But don't just take our word for it. The financial facts are there in black and white. This year, council spending on roads will drop a whopping 15 per cent on last year. This year we'll see a $20 million cut in the road resurfacing budget. Shame. More cuts to the suburb to cover the Lord Mayor's debt. Millions will be squandered on the over-budget vanity project widening Kingsford Smith Drive to save one minute of congestion, a project that's also facing a $100 million blowout. There's $24 million for the Allison Road roundabout upgrade and $24 million for to Renham Road Works. But the RACQ says, sadly, the rest of the city had shared the crumbs. Crumbs, Mr Chairman. While rates and debt are going up, crumbs for roadworks where they are needed the most. A swag of congestion-busting projects missed out, so ratepayers get to sit in traffic while this unelected Lord Mayor gets to parade around trumpeting his threat projects and ignoring anyone outside the CBD. Damn. What about those ratepayers caught up in congestion on Ipswich Road, Moggle Road, Kelvin Grove Road, Nogger Road, Waterworks Road, Old Cleveland Road and Coronation Drive? Yeah. Councillor Amanda Cooper agrees. Yesterday in this place, she bemoaned that Brisbane uh, Northside computers were forced to endure bumper to bumper traffic trying to get it into and out of the city. And not just cars, but on buses as well. While Councillor 
Cooper clearly agrees with Labor there's a significant issue, there's nothing in this budget to fix the problem. And not content with making commuters' lives a misery, the unelected Lord Mayor is also dipping into the hot hip pocket sorry, of those who actually get a car parked in the city. Hot on the heels of last year's 11 per cent hike, parking metre fees are up 2.5 per cent. But Srinna's money grab doesn't end there. Sorry, Councillor Srinna's money grab doesn't end there. The list is comprehensive. But here's a few more that stand out for special mention. Some waste disposal charges are up 150 per cent. City planning applications are up 75 per cent. Copping building approvals are up 75 per cent. This hard-hearted mayor has even increased grave fees more than twice the CPI. Does he have no shame? And if you want to put a plaque on a loved one's site, well, it will cost you plenty. These fees are up as much as 36 per cent. Is there nothing this administration won't try to make money from? Apparently not. Memorialisation fees in the Baby Memorial Garden have gone up 23 per cent. Making money out of people's misery. Not surprising, Councillor Strina has in front of the media to trumpet that aspect of his financial blueprint. Mr Chair, it's clear that Brisbane ratepayers cannot afford this Strina LNP rabble. A Harding administration will have a positive outlook for the people of this great city. Under the LNP, our city is stagnating. Councillor Shrina isn't borrowing to build for all of Brisbane, just to build for a select few. Ratepayers deserve better, and they will get much better under a Rod Harding team. For example, Team Harding will fundamentally change the relationship with residents when it comes to planning. Labor will give the power back to the people. It's their home, their neighbourhoods. We will lift the gag orders on community planning teams, preventing them from talking about their experiences through the process. Team Harding is not afraid of constructive criticism. Labor has already recommitted to providing the in local infrastructure that is needed as our suburbs develop. We will ensure every neighbourhood plan has an accompanying local infrastructure plan that will demonstrate to the community that Council is working with them, planning for growth. Importantly, these plans will go further than the legislatively required LGIP and include projects across key budget areas. The community will be empowered to identify and prioritise deliverable projects, which would then have delivery timeframes. We will do more than talk, we will act. We will do more than pay lip service, we will consult. And we will ensure Council is, an, is accountable to the community. With that in mind, kids are a community's most important resource, but it seems primary school children aren't even safe from this unelected Lord Mayor's cash grab. The fantastic Active School Travel Program, which is one of the most successful and universally supported behaviour change programs that Council runs, is already chronically underfunded. We know the team that in there does its very best with the pathetic amount of funding this LNP administration allocates. Well, they'll have to work even harder this year because the program has been slashed from $785,000 to just $665,000. In the 2020 financial year, funding was set to grow to $800,000, but Councillor Srinna has taken the axe to that too, earmarking just $674,000. Under a Harding Labor government, Labor administration, sorry, will only reverse these not only reverse these cuts, we'll properly invest in our children. We'll invest one million dollars in active school travel in each year of a Harding administration. Mr Chair, as I outlined last week, Brisbane is at the crossroads. It is becoming a city of haves and have nots under an LNP administration that has lost touch with the majority of the people it should be proud to serve. We live in one of the in the largest local government area in the country by population, yet for far too long it's been ruled by an LNP administration with eyes only for an ever shrinking ring around the CBD. If you choose not to live in inner city Brisbane, you don't get a Lord Mayor, you get a nightmare. If you want to bring up your family in the suburbs, you automatically join the forgotten people, out of sight and out of the minds of an elitist LNP addicted to self-promotion and power at all costs. People in Murray and Mitchelton and McDowell who vote for this LNP administration must genuinely wonder why they bother. Their rates go sky high to pay for the monumental ego-driven excess of the $650 million Kingsford Smith Drive program, and what do they get? A wait of four years to get their footpath fixed. In conclusion, the ratepayers of Brisbane have been dreadfully let down by this high-taxing, low-delivery budget by this unelected Lord Mayor who can't see beyond the story bridge. Budgets are about choices. And this uh, unelected Lord Mayor has chosen not to do the right thing by ratepayers. Rates are up more than 60 per cent above the inflation rate. Debt is up by more than a billion dollars. Instead, he chooses to ignore wards outside the CBD. 
Ratepayers want a council that will get back to the basics, roll up their sleeves and do the hard work Brisbane suburbs so badly need. They want a council that spends less time doing fluffy media conferences with TV cameras and more time doing the grassroots work for which they have been elected. They want a council that spends less on self-promotion and more on road resurfacing. In March, the people of this great city will have the chance to elect a Lord Mayor for all of Brisbane, not just a Lord Mayor for inner Brisbane. Labor will put ratepayers first. Councillor Schrinner is desperate for us to believe that his budget is for the long term, but it's really a short-sighted, cynical web of financial deceit, deceit designed to elect this, get this unelected Lord Mayor elected in March. The only thing long-term about this budget is the mounting level of debt. Ratepayers can get a better Brisbane by electing Team Harding. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on the budget on, uh, on a whole um, and to address um, just a few issues in summary. Um, from my point of view, uh, this administration is heading in the wrong direction. Um, they have got their priorities uh, uh, really, I think, out of whack, and it's it's starting to show um, in areas like planning, in areas like investment in infrastructure. Um, this administration is letting the people of Brisbane down, um, and it is it's disappointing uh, to watch it from a local level, and it's very disappointing to watch uh, what is happening to our city, uh, particularly when I do not agree with a lot of the uh, uh, issues that are coming up. Um, I mean, the, the issue of the metro is such a good example. I mean, that was presented to the public as an underground parastyle subway system, um, trains, tracks. It, it's, it's, it's absolutely spun out of this administration's control so that three and a half years on, um, it, it really hasn't progressed at all. Um, it is now a series of big bendy buses um, that uh, essentially we'll see 125 bus services cut uh, in other parts of the city with absolutely no guarantees about where bus services um, are going to continue in the future, which bus services will be truncated. Um, the lack of planning, the lack of um, uh, discussion with councillors about this, um, in addition to the failure to um, deliver on a project that was an election commitment um, and watch it watch it being I, I, were decimated, yeah, that's a pretty good word, thank you Councillor Strunk, um, is awful. And I still don't know, three and a half years on, what bus services in my ward are going to be cut. And I'm extremely worried that elderly residents in my part of the world are going to be asked to change buses twice to get into the CBD. Um, and that's where this administration is going wrong. If they'd have stood up at the election and said, we are going to invest in, in more busways and buses, um, that probably would have been a really good announcement. And as when the um, metro went from being a subway rail system to a bus system, that's what I said at the time. I mean, I think people support better bus services from Brisbane City Council, but that's not what this administration's done. Um, and three and a half years on, we are I don't even know where we're at. I mean, my understanding is that the Lord Mayor is criticising the state government when there's um, proposals sitting on his desk as we speak. So he's got he's got stuff, and he's still standing up, and he's blaming the state government for delays. And it's my understanding that he has proposals from the state government sitting on his desk, ready for his. Uh, feedback and discussion. Uh, I don't know what they are, but that's my understanding. Now, I just want to put on the record a few other things. Um, the Lord Mayor said, he said this about Labor, but I just want to take up the point that um, he says they have a negative approach and they're whinging. I want to point out that as I have done every year I've been an independent when I've been at, here at the budget, I have moved constructive uh, amendments to the budget to progress um, ideas and projects that are desperately sought by residents in my ward. Um, this year's budget debate, the hallmark has been um, the criticism from LNP councillors about the fact that I have tried to move an agenda forward for the people of Tennyson Ward. They are being neglected um, significantly by this administration. And we hear Councillor Hammond, Councillor Adams has done it too, stand up and say, well, you've got all that money back in the floods. Let me be clear, 
That was eight plus years ago, and all that did was repair damaged infrastructure. It was not for anything new. And even then, you didn't replace everything that was gone. We lost pontoons and playgrounds. But, and, and they got $400 million back from the feds. So eight years on, they're still using this as an excuse and it doesn't wash. I move four small amendments. Um, out of a three-plus billion dollar budget, there wasn't even a few hundred thousand dollars for these critical projects that I personally raised with the Lord Mayor, who says he wants to work constructively with me, but voted down the following four motions. Repairing a footpath that was requested to be repaired in 2013 at Lagonda Street Annerley, leading to a rail station, a park, schools and shops. Um, the LNP and this Lord Mayor voted against a refuge behind Graceful State School and a zebra crossing outside Graceful Rail Station. The Lord Mayor voted against flood mitigation through the delivery of backflow valves uh, in suburbs of Chelmer, Tennyson, Graceville, Fairfield and Yoronga, all recommended by an independent engineering report. And the Lord Mayor and the LNP voted against extending the operating hours of Fairfield Library because they want to prioritise the delivery of a golf course. Now, this says to me that their priorities are wrong. These are sensible, practical initiatives that will help uh, improve council services in Tennyson Ward, the livability of Tennyson Ward, and the safety of residents in Tennyson Ward. But this administration can't even support those minor projects. Now, I went and spoke to the Lord Mayor about the budget, and you know, I, everybody's been asking me, and I've said I'm giving him till the budget to, you know, see if the rhetoric is, is any substance behind the rhetoric. Um, I put forward 20 projects that I wanted to see uh, funded. Um, four of them got, and, and really it's three and a half because only half of Annalee is getting a footpath. So that's not on my side of the ward. Um, and, and I asked for a, a village precinct project or a skip. So I would, have, I would have given that one a tick if I'd have got the footpath on my side of the road, because that's a big component of it. So three out of 20, that's an epic fail in anybody's language. Um, and those projects were all really simple, straightforward things, things I've been advocating for today. So when the groans happened over there, these are the things I put to the Lord Mayor. Um, uh, a footpath reconstruction in Clifton Hill in Annerley, the uh, uh, Lagonda Street uh, footpath upgrade in Annerley, the low rail bridge at uh, Sherwood and Corinda, traffic lights for Hyde Road, Cansdale Street, the Verney Road east to Pell Street zebra crossing, um, which is a zebra crossing I put up, an LATM for Egmont Street, Sherwood, um, uh, an intersection upgrade on Ipswich Road and Venner Road at Annerley, uh, uh, where a distinguished local doctor died and this council has done nothing. Uh, Graceful Five Ways Intersection, listed on the LGIP to be done this year or next year? Nothing. Um, Graceful Memorial Oval turns 100 next year. I asked for a little bit of money to help with the tree conservation plan we've got going there. Nothing. Turley Street Playground, that is the tick. Pathway lighting in Normrose Park, that is the tick. And I will give Councillor Hammond some credit because they're both in her area. Toilet upgrade at Graceful, no. Backflow valves in Tennyson, no. Um, drainage in Yoronga West, no. Annerley Junction um, Village Precinct Project, no. Um, increasing Sherwood Street Festival from 20 to 25, well, I've asked and it's unknown, they won't say. Some money for the Fairfield Carols, opening the Fairfield Library seven days a week. Dunlop Park Car Park Upgrade, which services a pool, a school and a park. And free Wi-Fi in Sherwood. That's it. That's what I asked for. I mean, revolutionary, revolutionary ideas. Um, those 20 projects, and the Lord Mayor gets three, one, three, three out of 20, in fact. Not good enough. Meanwhile, rates are going up in my area. They've gone up every single year I've been a councillor, and my residents are not seeing a return. Yep. Debt is going through the roof. I don't believe it's ever got to $3,000 per capita, ever. So I think this Lord Mayor is going to inherit the mantra he decries up at George Street and he'll take on record levels of debt in this city. Um, and we're not seeing any investment in local infrastructure in Tennyson Ward. Oxley Road is ignored. The bridge is ignored. The low rail bridge is ignored. Footpaths are ignored. Um, playgrounds are removed and not replaced. Um, these are things that this council needs to address. The previous Lord Mayor announced $520,000 for the Arboretum last year. We now know that that was a mirage. 
All they did was pull the money from the maintenance and operational areas of the existing parts of council and pool it together um, and provide a salary for the new assistant curator. There is not a single cent in that budget for new projects for the Arboretum. Not a cent. Again this year, I will be left to fund um, new initiatives in the Arboretum out of the trust funds, as I have done every single year that I've been a councillor. I was at the Arboretum AGM on Sunday, and they are extremely concerned that they have been, I won't say lied to, because their view is they've been misled um, about uh, what this was going to be. It was a hallmark of last year's budget, and the reality of it is simply a mirage. It's not real funding. It's money to empty the bins and trim the trees that was already in the parks um, budget. So this administration has let Tennyson Ward residents down. It is simply not good enough. Um, it is incumbent upon the Lord Mayor and all councillors in this place to ensure funds are allocated fairly around the city, Councillor and that's Johnston, not happening. Your time has expired. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the 2019-2020 budget, and I'd like to thank all councillors for the debate. It's been a long couple of days, and I, for one, have been quite disappointed in the, in the grandstanding and the, and the um, back and forth negativity, but I, I feel I have no choice but to draw attention to some of the flaws in um, what is overall a disappointingly mediocre and, and unambitious budget. Um, there are a few major funding allocations that make a lot of sense, and I've talked before about some of those programs that I personally have been advocating for quite strongly. And in particular, it's nice to see that my crusade against golf courses is starting to yield results. Um, a few years ago, I was crit criticised quite relentlessly when I proposed converting Victoria Park Golf Course into public parkland. Um, and, and it's nice to see that there's been a change of heart from the administration. But um, there's also a wide range of smaller initiatives in the budget that will continue to make this city a, a great place to live, and, and it's worth acknowledging that it's not all bad. But um, I, and I will say my decision to vote against the various budget programs should not be misinterpreted or deliberately misrepresented as a vote against every single item and project within those budget programs. And I'll, I'll say that again because I'm sure some councillors are already um, planning their election strategy, but um, I'm, I'm very supportive of, of a lot of the stuff that's in the budget. And by voting against the pro programs, I'm not, not saying that all of it is bad, but um, I, I reject as a as a whole, the way that our city is um, planning and, and, and budgeting for the future. And, and so I thought I'd take a few moments to articulate what I think should be done differently, because I don't want to simply be hurling criticisms. I'm trying to offer constructive alternatives. And I think, first and foremost, we should be spending significantly less money on major road widening projects and other infrastructure projects that reinforce the car-centric and car-dependent nature of our transport network. By rethinking our approach to transport, we could save literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year, hundreds of millions of dollars a year that we could put towards the arts, community events and facilities, parks, environmental restoration, non-profit housing. And that doesn't mean that people have to sit in congestion. That means that we can have more money for public transport and active transport. It means that buses could be, God forbid, free. Imagine that. It's not utopian or unrealistic. That's entirely achievable. We have the money. We, we could actually afford to make, make buses and ferries free in this city if we thought carefully about where we allocate our funding. And I think related to this is the fact that our, our current urban planning strategy is, is driving up the costs of delivering essential services to this city. Our approach to zoning and, and densification of cramming extremely high density into some suburbs and neighbourhoods while neglecting other areas and, and reinforcing outer suburban sprawl actually drives up land values and, and leads to higher costs for delivering essential services and, and, and facilities. I'm really shocked that that Victoria Street Montague Road intersection is going to cost $11 million to install traffic lights. I'm really grateful it's happening. I'm so pleased that it's in the budget, but I think it's a sign that the, the city's approach to budgeting and delivery of infrastructure is not sustainable because there are 10 more intersections like that in my ward that all need traffic lights, that all need upgrading, that all need pedestrian safety improvements. And if they all come even close to that $11 million price tag, then this administration is not going to have the money 
to fund them. And I'm not leveling that as a direct critique of the LNP because I haven't really heard a, an alternative strategy from the Labor opposition either. There's a fundamental problem with how much money we are spending on road infrastructure, but also with the broader way we are developing and, and planning our city. We need to decentralise. We need to support commercial precincts, precincts and community facilities out in the suburbs so that fewer people have to travel all the way into the CBD for work and that so people have livable alternatives to living in the inner city. Because uh, as some councillors have alluded to, life in the inner city is pretty good for a lot of people because you don't have to deal with those really long, inconvenient commutes. You have a lot of other challenges like ridiculous construction noise disruption early in the morning and the fact that um, property is now ridiculously unaffordable for people on low incomes. But you don't have those long commutes. And I think it, we should be rethinking the way our city grows and develops and talking about how we can support those suburban nodes to a greater degree, not just by upzoning around train stations, but actually investing in infrastructure and services in those communities so that they become attractive for development and attractive for people to remain living in. We also need to overhaul the way we charge rates in this city. There are certain types of land uses, including commercial car parks, major shopping malls, large retail warehouse businesses that should be paying far more in rates, far more. They are getting an amazing deal from council at the moment where we spend millions of dollars upgrading the intersections, widening the roads to bring cars to these businesses. And then they contribute a pittance in terms of both infrastructure charges and ongoing rates revenue. So we are subsidizing these massive biz large, larger businesses and not and, and, and th thus creating an unfair advantage where lo smaller local small businesses can't compete. And, and we are actually driving smaller businesses out of business because we're supporting these larger corporations and larger w retail warehouse operations. So instead, we should be charging them higher rates and putting that money back into public transport, back into public parks, back into community facilities and housing. That's a better way forward. And that's really the only way that's going to be sustainable for this council because you are taking on more and more debt. And I'm, I'm probably the only councillor in here who's happy to argue that taking on um, public debt for infrastructure and services can be a good thing. But the amount of money you're spending just on ongoing maintenance of the road work is not sustainable and something needs to change. It has to change in a drastic way. I also think we should be charging much higher rates for vacant land and for em lot properties that are long-term empty. We should not be rewarding investors who land bank and then just leave commercial shops sitting empty, who leave um, properties derelict and abandoned for years and years waiting for their values to rise. Land banking is the hidden scourge of this city. It, it, it robs suburbs and, and streets of their, of their life and character. Um, it means that people on lower incomes can't afford a place to live because wealthy investors would rather leave their apartments empty than drop in the rent. There are now around 30,000 uh, dwellings in Brisbane that are long-term vacant. That's not holiday homes or, or landlords that are currently looking for tenants. Those are long-term vacant properties that investors are deliberately sit, leaving empty. And on top of that, there are thousands of square metres of underutilised land of vacant and neglected blocks. We should be charging the crap out of those people. We should be charging really high rates on those sorts of land uses and putting that money back into infrastructure and services. Other cities are doing this. Other, other countries have already embraced embrace this approach. And it's time for council to seriously reconsider how it treats those sorts of land uses because they are not efficient, they are not in the public interest, and they should not be encouraged in the way that they currently are. More generally, I'm, I remain concerned that, um, about the way we outsource so much of our essential um, contract essential service delivery. We rely heavily on private contractors, both for bigger and smaller projects and services, and that in turn drives up the cost of delivery. You talk to anyone who does, does these sorts of contracts and they'll tell you quite openly, yeah, we add in a profit margin. Yeah, we know the council contracts are, are particularly lucrative because they overcharge us. Private contractors overcharge council. They do it all the time. They love doing it. They see us as this big money bag that they can just keep tapping into. And so rather than continually outsourcing and privatising core services of this council, we should be delivering that stuff in-house. It would be cheaper, it would be more efficient, and we would have greater control over those projects so that we wouldn't have to ha have these difficult debates down the track with project managers and, and subcontractors when things go wrong. 
I'm, I'm really frustrated actually that we, we haven't, we, we've started talking in, in like about tiny incremental reforms around um, improving the tendering processes to local small businesses. But what we should really be doing is shifting to delivering more of that stuff in-house altogether. Um, I'm also still disappointed that there's not enough funding um, going towards environmental restoration, creek rehabilitation and rehabilitating the river. If we spend less money on roads, we would actually have enough money to clean up the Brisbane River. We could make that river clean enough to swim in. And when I think about the millions of dollars we're currently trying to spend attracting tourism to this city, um, assuming that tourists are just going to travel out all the way to Brisbane to see casinos and shopping malls, it makes me think, geez, what are our other great natural assets that we could instead be celebrating and valuing and supporting? And, and the river is definitely one of those. So I hope in future years that the river's edge strategy and, and the, the strategies around celebrating the river will not be tokenistic frills, but that we will make a meaningful investment into controlling erosion and sediment and cleaning up the Brisbane River. There's an amazing opportunity there to transform our city for the better, and it's up to us to grasp it. This is, there, there's, there's so much potential here. And Councillor Shree, your time has expired. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, I do uh, want to thank councillors who have contributed to uh, this debate. Um, it is uh, a long couple of days of a lot of talk and a lot of discussion, um, and uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who's contributed. I also do want to thank um, Councillor Cumming, the so-called leader of the opposition, uh, because he usually outsources most of his job to other councillors. He gets um, Cass Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook to do most of his media for him. Uh, but he did stand up and, did, and give a couple of speeches during this budget, so I do appreciate that he is uh, doing his job, the job that he's paid for. Um, it is good to see. It is good to see. Um, I know Councillor Cumming and his colleagues were very concerned that other councillors might be doing other things uh, whilst getting paid, but um, uh, yeah, it's good to see him doing that job. Let's talk about the suburbs, Mr Chair. This budget funds record investment right across the suburbs of Brisbane on the infrastructure, uh, that those suburbs need to grow. Uh, this budget funds a record investment in public transport uh, investment and subsidies right across the suburbs that benefits people in every suburb of Brisbane. Our seniors' uh, free off-peak travel benefits seniors in every single suburb of Brisbane. Our new first homeowners 50% rate discount will benefit new homeowners in every single suburb of Brisbane. Our small business support package with the reduced fees that come along with it will be available to businesses in every suburb of Brisbane. Our program of infrastructure investment, as I mentioned, uh, benefits residents right, right across the city of Brisbane uh, in every suburb. Our new universal housing incentive scheme will help deliver more accessible homes right across Brisbane, benefiting the suburbs of Brisbane and the residents of those suburbs. And then there's the new Suburban Renewal Task Force. Uh, once again, all about the suburbs. Now, Labor um, is very proud of the fact that they established the uh, Urban Renewal Task Force, and that has been a positive thing. That was all about the inner city. That was all about the inner city. I'm taking that model to the suburbs. So you would think, you would think that Labor councillors would be supportive, and particular Councillor Griffiths, who is interjecting now. Councillor, the councillors will be heard in silence, please. Particularly Councillor Griffiths, because he's got uh, more city versus suburbs rhetoric than any of the other councillors. He, in fact, he dusts off the same speech, and I think he's done that for the last decade, about the city versus suburbs. Yet. Yet the moment we announce the Suburban Renewal Task Force, what does he say? Does he support it? Does he welcome it? He's against it. He's against the Suburban Renewal Task Force. Why? Because he thinks... Point of order. Councillor Griffiths, point of order to you. Uh, claim to be misrepresented. Yeah. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, no, you haven't spoken. <laughs> actually. Councillor Griffiths, because you haven't spoken to this particular resolution, you, you can't claim to be misrepresented. Lord Mayor. 
So when we announce a task force to help revitalise suburban areas, despite Councillor Griffith's rhetoric about the city versus the suburbs and the suburbs being neglected, he opposes it. He's against revitalisation of the suburbs. I, I just can't fathom this. So it just goes to show how disingenuous their point, argument and line of attack point, is. Point of order. I apologise to the Lord Mayor for interrupting. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Um, just to be clear, the meeting local law says that any councillor who feels part of a previous speech um, has been misrepresented may stand up and claim a personal exp uh, explanation. We're still in the budget debate. Um, there is nothing to say that you can only do this in one motion or another motion. Otherwise, um, for example, in an ordinary council meeting, someone misrepresents you in E and C and it comes up in parks later, you couldn't say anything. So I, I don't believe, Mr Chairman, you're interpreting the rule correctly there. Councillor um, uh, Griffiths has spoken in this debate. Thanks, Councillor Johnson. I'll have a discussion. I'll allow Councillor Griffiths to speak at the end of the speech. Councillor Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the point is that uh, Labor can get up here and keep a straight face and say they're against something um, when uh, we know that they're being disingenuous. Uh, we know that on the one hand they can say they want suburban renewal, investment in the suburbs, but when you uh, initiate a program to deliver that, they will oppose it. Uh, but it is consistent with their approach right across the board. Uh, they claim they're against debt. They claim they're against higher taxes or rates. Yet everything about their record and their, the way they operate shows that they're not. It shows that they love those things. Uh, and the same goes for uh, what we've just been talking about. The suburbs are the big beneficiary of this budget right across the city. This, this is. This is a budget for the whole city. Hey, councillors will be heard in silence, please. This Good is man. a budget for the whole city, uh, and, it is, and it is a budget generated by an administration that is all about the suburbs of Brisbane, uh, an administration that has uh, the representation right across the suburbs of Brisbane, uh, in every part of the suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, but, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Mr Chair, sorry, uh, the, um, uh, the Labor line uh, is just a political one, as we know. Um, it doesn't have any basis in fact or reality. It is just a political line. And if their disingenuous approach when it comes to suburban renewal or rates or debt isn't enough, uh, the biggest and the best example uh, of their disingenuous approach is um, what they believe, uh, supposedly, or what they claim about council communications. Because they've been carrying on like pork chops now for a long time about council's communications programs, right. about the programs that are designed to uh, inform and engage with Brisbane residents about what council is doing on their behalf. Now, we have a $3 billion budget, and it is fair and reasonable that the residents of Brisbane know what their money is being invested in. Uh, we have an accountability to those people to let them know. Now, Labor would prefer that we didn't tell them because they only want their political lines to get up. They want their party political attacks to get up. But um, w when we see uh, their claims about corporate communications, they've repeatedly stood up in this place and said, oh, we would never do this. We would never do something like this. And in fact, the Labor state government up the road would never do this either. They would never do it. How many times have we heard Councillor Cumming or his colleagues say, oh, the Premier would never do this. The Labor state government would never do this. Yet last week we learnt that $1.2 million of taxpayers' money was spent by the state government in advertising the Cross River Rail project. $1.2 million. So, once again, it's a claim that Labor makes in here that has no basis in fact, which is completely dis disingenuous, uh, and which uh, we all know 
that Labor would do exactly the same thing if they Councilor, ever got uh, into Councilor administration. Cassidy, please cease interjecting. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, if you, Councillor Cassidy, I direct you to cease interjecting, and if not, um, you will be warned. Count, uh, Lord Mayor. You know you've got them when they, report, uh, when they resort to those kind of personal attacks and those ridiculous claims. Councillor Cassidy, you can... I've asked you to stop interjecting. You're using a highly pejorative term. It was demonstrated earlier that the Premier's image is on material for Cross River Rail. Please stop interjecting. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, so it's OK for the state government to spend $1.24 million of taxpayers' money in promoting the Cross River Rail project, yet it is completely inappropriate to do the same thing for the Brisbane Metro project or for, in fact, any other project. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy, I hereby warn you that unless you stop interjecting, um, I, will, I may suspend you for a period of up to eight days. Furthermore, Councillor Cassidy, if you're suspended, you, you must immediately leave this meeting place and must remain away from all meeting places for the period of the suspension. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank continue. you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, and then let's go to the hub of the issue. Let's go to the heart of the issue. And the heart is that Labor has repeatedly claimed that this is somehow party political advertising. If you want to talk about a lie, that is the biggest lie of them all. That is the biggest lie of them all. Point of order, Mr uh, Chair. Uh, Councillor Shree, point of order. I'm, ha I'm having difficulty hearing the speaker at the moment. I'd ask you to draw the chamber to order. I agree, uh, Councillor Shree. It is getting pretty rowdy in here. I appreciate that we've been here a, in here a long time. There is not much left to go. Please allow the Lord Mayor to conclude this meeting in silence. Yep. Thank you, Sorry, Mr. point Chair. of order. Just a procedural issue to clarify. I just want to get your ruling on this so we can be clear going forward. Um, you can't call someone a liar, but you can call what they say a lie. Is this um, what you mean by your ruling? I've asked Councillor Cassidy to cease interjecting. He used a range of terms. I've asked him to stop. I've formally warned him to stop interjecting, and, he, and from what I can hear, he has. Lord Mayor, please continue. Oh, thank Point you. of order, Mr yes. Chairman. Um, I'm seeking your ruling because the, de uh, the Lord Mayor um, has just said um, that what Labor have been saying is a lie. Yes. So I need you to clarify, please, what your ruling is with respect to the use of the word liar or lie, yes. so we are all clear in the future about what we are allowed to say. Thanks, Councillor Johnson. As, I, as I've always recommended, courtesy and proportion are important in this place. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. So, point of order, Mr Chairman. Um, Councillor move... Johnson, if you ask yep. the same question again, it is an act of disorder. I move dissent in your ruling as you've been unable to uh, apply the rule fairly to Labor and, L and LMP councillors. There's dissent in my ruling. And I will second that. Moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. All those in favour of dissent say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. 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 Councillor Cook, Division Councillor Griffiths. Uh, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Attendants, please close the bars. Uh, clerks, please read the result. Mr Chairman, the noes have it, the voting being six in favour, 19 against and one abstention. The noes have it. Please return to your chairs.
Lord Mayor, you have one minute and 15 seconds. Thank you, Thank you Mr Chair. Uh, look, let me put it this way, okay? The claim has been made by the opposition, and it is a false claim, that there is somehow party political advertising going on using ratepayers' money. This is false, 100 per cent false. And in fact, if that were to occur, that would be in breach of the rules of this council, and that would be something I would not support. And so it's not happening. Labor can continue all they like to claim it's happening. And I would suggest— Councillor Cassidy, I have, I have directed you to cease interjecting. Um, and I appreciate, and, and uh, if you continue to interject, I will suspend you. This is my final warning, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, and so they can continue to claim all they like that it's true. But I would simply say this: if you have any actual evidence that party political advertising is happening, send it to the CEO. Send it to the CEO, or in fact, se send it to whoever you like for independent assessment, because the reality is it's not happening. It's an absolute untruth. Uh, what is happening is genuine communication with the people of Brisbane. And that is our responsibility, because it is their money that is being invested in these projects, and they deserve to know about them, just like they deserve to know about the Cross River Rail project, right. just like Point they order, deserve Mr. to Chair. know about that project. Point of order to you, uh, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Shree take a question? Uh, Councillor, Lord, uh, no, due to time, you, uh, have, no. you have literally five seconds. Yeah, uh, thank you. Once again, I just so want to thank no, everyone that's been involved in this Lord budget for the long-term future of the city. There's a misrepresentation by Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Griffiths, please keep your misrepresentation to the matter at hand. Well, yeah, thank you. What I would like to say, and I won't use the word the Lord Mayor lied, but I will say that he didn't tell the truth in his representation of what I had said. I said um, that I, he said I was against suburban renewal. Quite clearly in this chamber, I said I was open to the concept of suburban renewal, but I was worried about how this administration would implement it and the way thank, they have looked thank, after thank you, developers Gibbets. in relation to it. All right. Um, uh, all right, now I will now put the resolution. All those in favour of the budget say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour, six against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Um, the resolution has passed. Councillors, please return to your seats. Yeah, I will do in a moment, but um, uh, my friends, that concludes the presentation and consideration of the 2019-2020 annual plan and budget, and I declare this meeting closed and will be returning in 15 minutes for the special meeting. <laughs>